An interna international interdisciplinary web seminar on modern trends in humanities, science and technology, and social sciences for sustainable development. In this section, in the total program, we have the special invited lecture from distinguished international speakers, Professor Shravani Shaha, Lincoln International Business School, University of Lincoln, United Kingdom, Professor Salma Akhtar, Department of Sociology, Dhaka University, Bangladesh, Dr. Indrajit Pal, Disaster Preparedness, Mitigation and Management, Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand, Dr. Koshi Dash, Department of Physics, University of Maryland, United States of America. We have these distinguished international speakers. In this session, we have the speaker, Professor Salma Akhtar, Department of Sociology, Dhaka University, Bangladesh. We are trying to communicate with Professor Salma Akhtar. Very soon, she will join and deliver her speech. All the participants, delegates, and viewers are requested to be in the web to attend the invited speech. This is a special request from organizing section of Seminar Committee APCRTC. We have another special invited speaker tomorrow, first half, Professor Modhumita Manna, Additional Director of Public Instruction, Administration, Education Directorate, Government of West Bengal. Now we are in the session of invited speech from Professor Salma Akhtar, Department of Sociology, Dhaka University, Bangladesh. All are requested to be in the web. Thank you.
Hello. Hassan Ali Ahmed, please switch off your mic. Ah. Hassan Ali, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Professor Salma Akhtar? Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hello? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Thank you, ma'am. We, we are eagerly waiting for such an invited lecture from Professor Salma Akhtar, Department of Sociology, University of Dhaka. This is my privilege to introduce such an eminent international professor, Salma Akhtar. She has completed her first work from University of Cambridge in 1997. She is an editorial board, board member of Journal of Non-Profit and Public Sector Marketing, published from United States of America. Hello? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Can you hear me, ma'am? This is the problem related with the web. I think all of the participants and the delegates will cooperate with us because this is a problem related with the network issue. Mam is there uh, and she will surely uh, start her presentation or uh, in fact a lecture immediately. Please bear with us. We are just trying to uh, communicate with Professor Sama. Madam, uh, am I audible?
as uh, some network issues are there and uh, now at present it is not possible uh, we are trying to uh, connect professor salma after uh, and she uh, probably uh, will solve the problem regarding the network issue now we want to uh, start our technical session simultaneously when uh, salma after will be there then we will stop the last uh, presentation and then we will uh, again enter into the invited uh, speech in this link and in this meeting itself uh now i request doctor nine now i request doctor jinia mitro head of the department department of women studies university of north bengal to chair the session of the technical part and we will continue the session as we have some time constraint and in the meantime our technical team will communicate professor salma after when she will available then we will stop the presentation and then we will go to the invited speech so i request dr jinia mitro to be in the chair of the technical session madam please good afternoon and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, listen to uh, such uh, uh, illuminating uh, personalities from over the world uh, so i look forward to hearing uh, our first uh, presenter uh, may we start the session professor hasan ali amit may we start the session ma'am uh as we are uh, yes. out of the section so yes. it has been rescheduled now i request uh prati dotto assistant professor of ethical government college to present his paper and request dinia mitro dr dinia mitro to chair all the session yes. so ma'am uh, now i request Bhakti Dr. to present his paper. Madam is on the chair. Please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Can you please? Uh, I since I don't have the bio, can you please briefly introduce yourself? And uh, I look forward uh, to your uh, excellent paper. Hassan Ali Ahmed, one of the delegates who present in the meeting, are softly and kindly requested to please put off your video. Sir, please. Now, I will put Bapi Dutta to present his paper. मंडपाठ्य 
Professor Parmatha is an eminent professor of sociology, University of Dhaka. He has completed her research work from the University of Indies in 1994. He is an editorial board member of Journal of Non-Profit and Public Sector Marketing, published from United States of America and Canada. He traveled many countries like Finland, Sri Lanka, as educational tool. She has also penned many books. Her hand, her hard work is reflected in more than 10 publications in different international journals. She has been awarded with two international prizes like Minna Kant Award from Finland and Commonwealth Scholarship from United Kingdom. If I start Telling her qualities, it will take a pretty long period. So I prefer to hand over the session to her. I request Professor Sarmakta to deliver her speech, for which we all the viewers, participants, and delegates are eagerly waiting for hearing to you, ma'am. So please over to ma'am, Professor Sarmakta. Thank you so much. And I'm extremely sorry about the inconvenience caused by the internet connectivity uh, crisis. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, of an interdisciplinary international web seminar on modern trends of humanities, science and technology, and social sciences for sustainable development, organized by Asharjo Profula Chandraroy Government College, Chiliguri, and in collaboration with UGC Human Resource Development Center, the University of North Bengal. And I'm very privileged to be here today with you and share a few of my thoughts on the sustainable development goals of Bangladesh and how this is seen from a different gender perspective. So I'm just trying to uh, share my screen. I'm sorry, uh, how do I share the screen? Can you see my screen? Hello? No, 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 no ma'am. No, ma it's not visible. Ma'am, you can see the uh, arrow over there. Uh, present. Would you present now? Yes. 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 Try screen. OK. Can you see it now? No. No, ma'am, not yet. There's an arrow there. Click the arrow on the screen. Ma'am, mm -hmm. uh, uh, click on a uh, window. Click on a uh, window, ma'am. Share. Click a uh, window. Present now. Present now. Present now. Mm. Are you seeing it or not? Yes, yes ma'am. It's visible now. Okay. So sorry. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, actually, uh, the title of my presentation is a gender perspective of socioeconomic dynamics of sustainable development in Bangladesh. Uh, I would uh, actually go very quick as uh, I've already taken a huge amount of time and I, I hope to actually listen to others as well. We all know about the SDGs and Bangladesh is very much committed to uh, 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 perceive and also, you know, the uh, achievement of the SDGs in Bangladesh, uh, despite of huge, uh, uh, huge uh, challenges Bangladesh is facing regarding this. But we know that Bangladesh was very much appreciated uh, overall regarding its uh, MDG achievements, particularly regarding the gender. And in recent time, also regarding SDG um, achievement, Bangladesh has been also been uh, recognized and appreciated. So I would like to go on to the different SDGs and what Bangladesh is actually trying to do, do about it. So the first SDG, and poverty and all it, it forms everywhere, Bangladesh is actually uh, trying to reduce the proportion of population living below extreme poverty line below 3%. And uh, also to reduce the population living national poverty line is below 10%. And is doing so, actually, uh, it's trying to reduction the headcount poverty ratio by about 6.2% points from 24%, 4.8% uh, to 18.6%. And also reduction of extreme 
poverty by 4% percentage points, which is 8.9% in 2020. And it's also spending widely on social protection as a share of GDP, and it's trying to increase it 2.3 uh, to actually also create a um, um, na national level and regional level fund. We know that worldwide women are actually facing loss of inequality. And if we look at worldwide, we see 1.3 billion women do not have access to formal financial institution. Later on, I'll have a, a, a presentation, short presentation on what Bangladesh women are, women are facing. Regarding the SDG ending hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition and promoting sustainable agriculture. Uh, so Bangladesh is also focusing on food transfer program and, and, and social security program and also is trying to reduce proportion of stunting among under five children from 36.1% to 25%. Actually, this is seven five-year plan. The eight five-year plan was just recently declared. Uh, my data is not yet updated, so that's actually much better than this. And it's, it was also focusing on reducing proportion of underweight children among uh, under five uh, from 32.6 percent to 20 percent in the 2018 global hunger index bangladesh ranked 86 out of 119 qualifying countries which score bangladesh as 26.1 but Bangladesh was suffering from a level of hunger that was really serious, but still Bangladesh position was ahead of its neighboring countries. And so Bangladesh uh, was trying to actually achieve more. And we know worldwide 43% of agricultural labor are women ensuring food security, but only 15% of the agriculture extension workers are women. And female far farmers get only 5% of extension service in 97 countries. And as we know that women prepare the food at home, but still 90% uh, of the women are preparing food, but they consume the list. Regarding SDG3, ensuring health, lives, and promote well-being for all at all ages, and uh, Bangladesh is actually focusing on under five mortality rate to be reduced from 41 to 37 percent in thousand live births, and maternal mortality rate to be reduced from 170 to 105 and immunization regarding all kinds of uh, uh, diseases to be increased to 100%. And, and in immunization, Bangladesh has also been very much appreciated. This coverage is really very high. And births attended by skilled health staffs to be increased to 65%, where it's still lacking. And reduction of total fertility rate to 2 and increasing contraceptive prevalence rate to 75%. Uh, if we look at the worldwide uh, scenario, we see that 225 million women still have unmet need of contraceptives and maternal mortality is 14 times higher in the developing country. In SDG 4, we see that inclusive and equitable education, uh, Bangladeshi is actually achieving 100% net enrollment rate for primary and secondary education, and is focusing on ensuring uh, equality education in primary, secondary, and tertiary education for both the gender, and percentage of cohort reaching grade 5 to be increased to 100% from 80%. And women's literacy rate worldwide, we are seeing increased. Uh, and the world is from 76% uh, in 1990 uh, is now increased to 85%. But the sub-Saharan African countries are still lagging behind. And we see the 23% poor rural girls complete primary education. In the, regarding the gender equality and empowerment of women, I'll uh, provide some of the data later on. Here we are just talking about that in gender parity indexed in tertiary education is focusing uh, is it's in focus and is uh, uh, government is uh, aiming to raise it from 7.70 to one, and the ratio of literate uh, female to male age group 20 to 25 percent is aimed to be raised from uh, 200 percent from 86 percent. And increase the share of female officials grade nine and above to, in the public sector is also aimed to be 25 percent by 2020. And on, a, on an average, women in the labor market, we see that worldwide is 24 percent less than men. And in 2015, it was 22 percent of all parliamentarians female. So in UN, even now, we see one in three women face, uh, even a worldwide UN report says one in three women face physical and sexual violence all over the world. And one 33 million girls and women in 29 African and Middle Eastern countries have 
uh, genital mutilation, so which means that gender violence is still an issue. We'll look into the Bangladesh scenario as well later on. Uh, when we are talking about the availability and sustainability of management of water and sanitation for all, Bangladesh is actually focusing on safe gender, uh, safe uh, drinking water, and uh, also sanitation in both at the household level and all, uh, also in the institution level. And so there, uh, in the urban areas, the target is to increase it from 100%, and for rural areas, 90%. And we see the 2 billion people worldwide gain access to clean water from 1990 to 2010. And 2.4 billion people still rely on unimproved sanitation facilities. In the schools, lack of separate facilities for girls is a major reason for parents keeping that at, at home worldwide, even in Bangladesh in some of the areas. And when we're talking about the access to reliable, affordable, sustainable motor energy uh, and electricity uh, consumption and electricity coverage and energy coverage, we see that in Bangladesh, gen uh, the electricity uh, generation flow is to be increased to uh, 23,000 megawatt. And electricity cover is, is trying to be increased to 96% and increase energy efficiency by 10%. And Bangladesh is one of the most affected and dangerous countries, even being one of the least carbon emitting countries. Uh, the, uh, the per capita carbon emission in Bangladesh is very low, but is uh, one of the worst uh, uh, vulnerable countries of the world who is a victim of the carbon emission. Uh, but when we are talking about worldwide decision, now we see that only 4% of the women are in the World Energy Council chair, which means that very few of them can take a decision regarding energy consumption and also uh, safe energy. And some indicators suggest that women are more likely than men to conserve energy and using up 22% less and including through a greater willingness to alter everyday behaviors. And women are largely absent in the industries that produce modern sources of renewable energy comprising 25% of the workforce. And when we're talking about sustainable, inclusive development, economic development, full and productive employment and decent work for all needs to be ensured. So here we see in Bangladesh, the attaining average real GDP growth rate 7.4% over the year and is a, a planned period and total revenue were expected to be raised from 10.7 GDP to 16.1 by fiscal year 2020 and 12.9 million additional jobs were expected to be available by this time, and 2 million jobs abroad. And FDI also were expected to be increased uh, 9.6 billion uh, by 2021.57 billion. If we talk about the worldwide women's condition in the, um, uh, in the economy growth, we see that 50% of the world's working age women are in workforce. And 20 years ago, 40% of the women were engaged in wage and salary jobs. And today, 48%, which means the percentage is not much increased worldwide because of the gender stereotypes often define women, women's work and can channel women into some of the worst jobs. And among 143 countries, at least 90% uh, 90 of them have legal restrictions on women's employment in other than the stereotypical jobs and as well as in the job market. Uh, resilient infrastructure, inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation is one of the SDG goals. So Bangladesh is focusing on fast tracking a number of transformational infrastructure projects. And it's also trying to increase the contribution of the manufacturing sector to 21.5% of GDP by uh, fiscal year 20 from 17.8% uh, from 2015. And you know that Bangladesh is very much dependent on the garment sector, which is very much uh, uh, women driven, 80% of the work is a woman. And regarding the other in, uh, um, export and also manpower export, women are still contributing great in Bangladesh. Uh, if we look at worldwide, just in one in five countries have achieved 45 to 55 percent women in the research. So which means that uh, when we are talking about uh, women's, uh, using women's uh, voices, using women's thoughts, it's still many of the countries are still lagging behind. Reduce inequality uh, within and among the countries. So Bangladesh is trying to provide social protection as a share of GDP uh, so that inequality is reduced. And women parliamentarians are 
quite uh, uh, increased in Bangladesh. And also overall worldwide, we have seen that women parliamentarians numbers are increasing. Make cities and human settlement inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Uh, Bangladeshi is trying to improve water resources, uh, sources uh, um, uh, in the urban dwellers, and also having lots of infrastructure uh, development programs, including uh, 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 connectivity, and also uh, a sustainable urban development and supports increased productivity, investment, and employment. So Bangladesh is having a wider development program. As you know, the country is uh, looking forward to be graduated to a middle-income country very soon. But if we talk about disaster and if we talk about uh, sustainability, we see that worldwide gender inequalities is a huge issue in the structural development as well as uh, overall industrialization and development activities. When you're talking about climate change, we know that disaster risk reduction is uh, coming into focus of Bangladesh uh, in the project design, in budgetary location, and in implementation processes. And 500 meter wide green belt is planned to be established and protected along the coast. And we know that coastal belt in Bangladesh is very much um, affected by natural disasters. And women are taking very heavy load, uh, both uh, by physical death as well as losing their resources. And if we look at worldwide, we see that though men are vulnerable people uh, and risk uh, having a high risk from climate change, and particularly the poorer women, uh, and also this is a daily reality for them, but uh, uh, and also they spend a huge hour on uh, gathering food, gathering fuel and water, and struggling to grow crops. But when disaster strikes, women are actually the worst victims and very likely to be perished. Uh, regarding the sustainability, uh, sustainable use of oceans and marine resources, Bangladesh is also considering budgetary allocations and implement, uh, keeping that on an implementation process. And we know that world's, uh, world's 70% uh, uh, oceans uh, and women make up 47% of the world's 120 million people working in fisheries and outnumber men in both large scale marine fisheries and small scale inland fisheries, 54% and 60%. 6%. And yet, women are largely concentrated in low skill, low paid jobs, irregular and seasonal employment in processing, packaging, and marketing. And same here in Bangladesh, women are contributing a great, great deal to the fisheries, uh, particularly the uh, small scale fisheries, but uh, still we see that uh, they are not actually coming into the skilled labor market, they're st still remaining in the unskilled labor force. And when we're talking about the ecosystem, uh, Bangladesh is obviously focusing to uh, have productive forest coverage of 20% and with 70% tree density, but only 24% women worldwide also are in focal point regarding the forest and gender responsive budgeting show financial deficits in 90% in countries as well regarding uh, the women's participation in the forest and also the budgetary allocation regarding that. And when we're talking about inclusive societies and sustainable development and peace, we see that uh, corruption, uh, access to information, and making parliamentary processes are effectively are uh, in the main focus of Bangladesh government. And if we talk about worldwide, we see only 9% negotiators in peace struggles are women, though war impacts women very differently and densely. So what are the major challenges of Bangladesh in achieving in SDGs? We see one of the issues, obviously, the financial side, because we have seen that the, uh, it needs a global in a huge um, investment. And also Bangladesh is investing to the important sectors but still not up to the desired level. Budgetary allocation on social security, uh, allocation on health sector, and uh, also who suggested that uh, th this should be 5% and still Bangladesh is struggling to get up to that level. Unemployment of youth is another huge challenge for Bangladesh towards the SDG development. And we know that in the uh, demographic composition, Bangladesh is at this moment having an advantage of having a huge number of youth. But unfortunately, because of the unemployment, it's not getting the benefit of it. And according to Bangladesh Bureau Statistics 2016 and 17, the unemployment rate was 4.2%, around 2.6 million 
six eight million youths were unemployed among them 1.36 million youth were between 15 to 24 years of age so which means that a huge number of youth including women are uh, unemployed and this is actually higher than south asian average 9.45 and dropout rate, uh, we know due to the COVID, dropout rate of the schools are going up and this is becoming a huge challenge for Bangladesh to achieve the sustainable development regarding education. So why women is an important issue? Why have we brought women's issue in the, uh, in the SDG perspective? We know that if we talk about women's issues, uh, it uh, came into discussion since 1970, 1980, and different perspective life, women in development, women in development, and gender in development had been there. There were several international conferences focusing on gender equity, gender equality, women empowerment. And we know the 1995 Fourth World Conference of Women in Beijing actually marked a significant turning point for the global agenda for gender equality. And later on, we know that uh, every five years there were the uh, reviews and to see that how much the world has achieved. And after that, uh, we know the MDG and SDGs came into the uh, uh, scene for uh, ensuring women's uh, uh, empowerment. So the centrality of women's empowerment is basically to have a inclusive society because we know that 50% uh, of the world's population is women and the SDGs uh, slogan is we don't uh, I'm leaving no one behind so if we think about leaving no one behind we can't think about leaving women in the back so regarding the gender equality we know that SDG is focusing on end discrimination against all women and girls, recognize the value of unpaid care work and domestic work, eliminate violence against all women and girls and ensure women's participation in leadership and decision making, eliminate all harmful practices such as child marriage and ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health rights. So how to do that? One is undertaking reforms to give women equal rights to economic resources, including land, enhance the use of information and communications technology and adapt and strengthen policies and legislations but we see still there the long way to go there are differences and inequalities both in bangladesh and all over the world and from gender equity the bangladesh and all other countries have taken the uh, perspective to uh, move towards gender equality from gender equity and to gender empowerment so with all of this, where is Bangladesh standing at this moment regarding gender equality? So if we look here, we can see that Bangladesh HDI value for 2018 was uh, 0 0.614, and which put the country in the medium human development category. And if we look in the gender development index, uh, regarding the gender inequalities and we can see that uh, in education and in uh, human development indexes, Bangladesh is uh, doing uh, far better in recent years and uh, female and male expected years of schooling the gap between that is uh, getting closer and we can see according to the world economic forums agenda development report bangladesh stood 47 position in 144 nations in the world and stood top country consecutively three times in the south asian countries and in bangladesh 20.3 percent of the parliamentary seats are held by women and 45.3 percent of adult women have reached at least a secondary level of education compared to 49.2 percent of their male counterparts in comparison to nepal pakistan are ranked 115 and 136 respectively in the gii so the status of improving in Bangladesh uh, count, uh, count uh, women uh, to the counterpart of their uh, man counterpart in, uh, in health and education and uh, in, in actually in 2020 Bangladesh is ranking 50 so it's actually going up and a reduction of the gaps of the literacy rate is also quite uh, apparent but still now there are some areas where Bangladesh have concern regarding gender equality and equity. Here we see that there are 13% of the women are chronically malnourished and women's participation in labor force is 36% compared to 80.7% for men, World Bank's 2017 report. And 72.6% of ever married women have experienced one or more forms of gender violence, sexual, economic and emotional, according to Bangladesh Bureau Statistics 2015. And Bangladesh ranks fourth in the world for rates of early marriage, with 22% of girls married by age 15 and 59% married by age 18. Girls Not Bride, UNICEF's report 2017. So, according, uh, so 
in one side, we are seeing that Bangladesh is having an uh, uh, upward mobility regarding women's participation in uh, labor force, women's participation in the decision making, in the um, administration, in parliament, in the uh, judiciary. But at the same time, the common women, particularly in the rumen, rural women and in the poverty stricken areas, there is still the presence of child marriage, which is challenging Bangladesh government's uh, the targets and the plans of gender equality. And uh, unfortunately, obviously, this is challenging the human rights issues of uh, women in Bangladesh. But we see that the constitution of Bangladesh and the policies of Bangladesh are very much gender friendly because the constitution is ensuring the commitment of overall development of women in Article 27, 28, 29, and 65 of the Constitution. Bangladesh is a signatory of almost all international agreements related to women's development, including the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And in several laws, anti-poverty, uh, sorry, anti-dowry Pro prohibition act, 1980, cruelty of women law, uh, women and children repression act, and the major ones are prevent violence against women, dom domestic violence law, 2010. So all of these mobile court against the uh, if teasing and sexual harassment, all of these are contributing to betterment of the women's si situation, and also the seventh, eight, five years plans, national women's policy, national women's policies, 22 terms women development policy and national children policy all of these are trying to have a better situation of gender equity for both women and children but unfortunately with all of, and Bangladesh is visioning uh, you know uh, 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 is vision 2021 achieving that and also the middle income country and all of these laws are by these government are trying to have that but still we are seeing that we are living far behind uh, than our uh, expected achievement. So what we can do, obviously, we can think about uh, capacity development, we can think about campaigns, gender sensitization, awareness raising events, partnering with other organizations, national level multi-stakeholder committee, and creative use of media and arts to raise awareness of women and women's access to information and resource by legal reform, and basic use of gender uh, mainstreaming and gender budgeting. So all of these, if we can effectively use in, in, in spite of we know that Bangladesh is being appreciated for its achievement in the SDGs but still in uh, SDG 5 I think uh, we still have to go a little further. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a very, very illuminating presentation indeed by Professor Salma Akhtar on S. DG in Bangladesh and GDP in Bangladesh. I will especially thank her for talking about the inequality women face everywhere. They are 50% of the population, somewhere more, but are the least consumers, be it food or education. Also, they make up the major portion of the unpaid labor. They are also soft targets of sexual harassment. When we talk of sustainable development, we cannot overlook this uh, gender inequality. It is some good news that Bangladesh is doing well as far as gender equality is concerned. So thank you so much for your illuminating uh, presentation lecture. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Salma, ma'am. Uh, on behalf of APC Roy Government College, I wish you uh, Thank you once again. And due to time constraint, we yeah, <laughs> have yes. to move uh, uh, to the, our technical session. Our uh, next technical session chair uh, person, sir, uh, Dr. Bhaskar Goswami, sir, already joined with us. Uh, Bhaskar Goswami, sir, uh, head of the department, Department of Economics, uh, University of uh, Badwan. Uh, sir, are you here, sir? Bhaskar, sir. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon to all the participants, all the audience uh, in this webinar. Uh, we may proceed to the se uh, technical session. Thank you, Professor Salma Aster.
for her nice and elaborate presentation related to it. the problems associated with food security, social security, and related problems of Bangladesh. In this international platform, Madam has already been described the major issues, the social issues of Bangladesh, and thank you ma'am to be here with us and to be in this international platform for your excellent innovative speech on behalf of organizing committee, APC the Government College. We again thank Professor Salma Akhtar, eminent professor of sociology, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now we are going to the technical session. And in this technical session, there are uh, 11 participants. This technical session will be chaired by Professor Bhaskar Goswami, Honorable Head of the Department, Department of Economics, Vardhaman University, eminent economist of the world. I request Professor Goswami to be in the chair and to organize the session. And in this case, total program will be moderated by Professor Shogoto Ghosh along with Kiali Halda. I hand over the technical part to Professor Shogoto Ghosh and Kiali Halda to assist our honorable chair to moderate the program. Professor Shogoto Ghosh and Kiali Halda, please. Good afternoon. In this technical session, that is technical session 1A, there are 11 speakers are there. Panchali Shen Gupta are you present? Yes, yes. I am here. Okay. Divas Gupta. Dr. Vardai Hariti. Isha Mokhtan. Rupam Shingo Rai. Yes, 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 I present. Okay. Dr. Sikhanta Chakraborty. Yes, sir, I am present. Okay. Patsu Dash. Yes, I am present. Okay. Ritu Parna Khan. Sir, I am present. Okay. Ramkanai Shingo. Yes, sir, I am present, sir. Okay. Sonali Chakraborty. Yes, sir, I am presenting okay. here. Okay. Now, please, Panchali Shengupta. First of all, uh, I want to say please um, follow the uh, time schedule and within that time, please complete your lecture. And now I call Panchali Shengupta. Am I audible to everyone? Yes. So all the respected resource person present here, a very good afternoon. All the members of organizing committee, my fellow colleagues, resource scholars and participants. I am Dr. Panchali Shengupto from the Department of Economics of St. Joseph College. Uh, so I would like to present a paper on uh, gender perspective on non-marketed work, uh, just a minute, let me present. Is the screen visible to you? Is the screen no, visible to no, you? No,
Is it visible now? No. Videos of presenting in the center screen is not coming. Video is not on. Just a moment. Sorry for the interruption. Is it coming now? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. So my uh, topic is gender perspectives on non-market work uh, and national income uh, statistics. Just a minute. Just a minute. Uh, yes. uh, one, uh, one announcement is there. Uh, actually, we are running a, a parallel session. Those who are 1B, you join the link 1B. Those who are in 1C, please join in the link through the link join C. And those who are in session 1A, they will only uh, in this uh, platform only. Otherwise, do uh, other participants will go to their respective Google Meet. Thank you. Excuse me, huh? Hello. I am hearing, sir. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, how many times will give? Uh, we will give you uh, uh, six to seven minutes to uh, deliver your lecture, and you have to conclude within seven minutes. And there will. Uh, two or three minutes will be discussion. Okay, 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 thank you. Okay. So, can I continue now? Yes, yes. So, as I have mentioned, that uh, my topic is the gender perspectives on non market work. So, uh, in uh, the non market work and national income statistics, we are basically focusing here in this paper the non marketed unpaid work of women in rural areas. Now, in standard work definition, that is, we got from census, economic work implies the distribution of economically productive physical or mental activity by the worker, leading to production of goods and services, either for consumption or for exchange. Under such definitions, the household activities and even the farm activities of rural women which are unpaid doesn't result in the ultimate production as a visible income in the national income statistics. Women's work always remains invisible, unrecognized, unregulated. Though there is a problem of counting women's unpaid work in national income statistics, but according to Iron Munger from Australia, he mentioned that unpaid domestic and related work, if it is included in the national income statistics, our gross national product, GNP, or even GDP, can be much higher than the actual amount we are getting now. And in the same calculation that has been done by the developing countries like India, where most of the women work is on unremunerated or non-remunerated, the differences would be even greater. And that's why the UNDP in 1995, they have shown a statistics that women work longer hours than men in almost all the countries of the world. For the developed countries, it is 51% total workload that is been taken by the women. And for the developing countries, it is 53%. So in reality, women workers work more than men that we all know, and especially in rural areas where these women are marginal workers or not even counted as workers in the national accounts. So I have already mentioned that there may be some difficulties in measuring these unpaid work. But ultimately, United Nations, they have classified in 1993, they have introduced the system of national accounts where marketed and non-marketed activities are classified on the basis of gender. So there are many important studies that are related with the unpaid work of women. That is, that I have mentioned here, you can have a look, that Aaron Monger, 
Goldsmith Parman, they have done the studies on 12 OECD countries. Even UNDP also mentioned the importance of unpaid work. And in India, Indira Hirove, the, uh, the director of Center for Development Studies, Tiruvannandapura, he has also done few studies. And especially if we concentrate on West Bengal, then Nirmala Banerjee done her studies on unpaid work of women also. Now, before going to that unpaid work of women, here I would like to mention one thing. Now, there are hardly any conventional statistics that are available on unpaid work of women. And to overcome this lacuna of conventional statistics, an alternative method has been followed by many countries of the world, which is known as time use survey. Now, different countries, they have taken the time use survey and they have done the time use studies that I have mentioned here, that uh, the, the researchers they have done in, on several countries in different years. Now, finally, in India, 1998-99, Central Statistical Organization, they have done the time use survey. They have selected only six states, Haryana, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Orisha, Tamil Nadu, and Meghalaya, to do this time use survey depending on the system of national accounts. Now, what they have done, they have categorized three kind of activities. The first one is SNA activities, which are falling under the production boundary of system of national accounts. That may be remunerative, may be non-remunerative. Extended SNA activities are particularly related with unpaid activities and domestic activities of women. And non sna activities are those activities that we do for our personal relaxation, say leisure time we are, or for social gathering, whatever we are doing for our own personal maintenance. So if we check their data, then it is very much visible to us that that SNA activities, the men are spending more time on SNA activities. Now we have to know that these SNA activities are mostly remunerative pay or paid activities. And extended activities are mostly unpaid activities. Now, if we compare the, the time spent by male and female, they have done this, uh, uh, this uh, survey over the 18,000 households in uh, six states, states. So, in extended SNA activities, the, the male are spending only 2.1.7% of their total time, whether women are spending only 11.14%, much more. And that is also reducing the the time that women are spending on for the non SNA activities, that is that they are consuming, they are consuming more time in unpaid activities, and that is also pushing them to consume less time for their rest and relaxation. So, depending on this time use survey, uh, I have done one uh, 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 primary survey also. Before that, uh, before that slide, I'm going to present you the uh, because we are here only we are. Uh, concentrating on the rural areas, especially the rural areas. So, in rural areas, that's uh, the, the study has been done in rural areas, especially the villages where the primary occupation is agriculture. And the major objective of the study is to adopt the rural agricultural household as the unit of analysis, just to export the gender division of labor among the rural household, subjecting its contents to the theories of household rural economy. With the existing traditional norms, the patriarchy systems, and the gender roles. So, if we look at the rural work participation rate, I have mentioned here the rural work participation rate from 1951 to 2001, 2011, it's almost 50% of the male participation rate. So, that I was telling you that conventional statistics has become very difficult to get the data on unpaid works of women. <coughs> So the major objectives of the study is to identify the stereotype work done by women, especially in agricultural fields, and to focus that as an individual worker, how much work they are doing or what kind of work they are doing, and to provide the estimates that how men and women allocate their time in different kinds of paid work, unpaid work, and leisure work, and also to recognize the contribution that they are actually economically they are producing. So that kind of estimation has been done in this study. 
so for the primary uh, primary study i have selected three villages of kalimpong district uh, now it's in kalimpong district earlier it was in darjeeling district bong khasmohal uh, kalimpong khasmohal and salembang khasmohal i have not mentioned those things here so uh, the cso central statistical organization when they have done their time use survey they have actually identified 154 activities in india but for a single researcher hello uh, 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 please try to complete uh, within uh, one or two minutes because already okay. seven minutes uh, no. so these are the different activity patterns that i have taken okay so uh, on the basis of this different activity patterns i have calculated their con uh, contribution through opportunity cost method now this is just i would like to explain this because without explaining this will not be understand that this for these activities there are existing wages is there so for these activities generally the usual standard of working hours is assigned as 8 hours now we have divided this rupees 140 that is the existing wage by 8 so we are getting the hourly wage now in case of rural women in agricultural area especially they are not engaged as a paid labor they are engaged as a family labor so they are spending less time than the standard working hours so whatever the they are they are spending their time and whatever their usual days of engagement in a month that i have calculated on the basis of the total contributing hours i have multiplied this total contributing hours with the average wage uh, assigned for each hour and contributed whatever their total contribution that i have calculated this this wages this for these activities the wages are given wages existing wages but for few activities as i told you there are uh, there is no data for the even the existing wage yet so what we did we just asked them if they hired any any labor for this activity how much they are charging for those activities on the basis of this we have calculated their total contribution just keep in this so the total contribution this study i have done in 2015 16 the total contribution from table a b c we are getting is 5227 so if we count it now it would be much more higher than this so the major findings of the study is the division of labor within a rural household generates a hierarchy of paid and unpaid work actually pushing women into a subordinate social and economic position and involvement in market activities generally gives more power to women but as they are involved in non marketed activities that's why their empowerment is not going on in that way for the rural areas and time use methodology could particularly effective in capturing the working women's role and in the conclusion just i would like to say that uh, we need to remember that empowerment cannot be found by simply rejecting the unpaid work that women have shouldering for decades for real equality unpaid work needs to legitimize and given due recognition only then we can expect equal participation in the workforce or gender equality in this respect just i would like to conclude with this uh, slide in this respect i am happy to say that finally that indian government they have realized these things and finally nsso have conducted time use survey uh, from january 20 2019 to december 2019 and they have published the report in september 2020 and whatever the findings they got that are very much similar with whatever we did in the primary study so thank you thank you very much dr panchali sundukto for her nice presentation and uh, one humble request from the organizing committee is there and we have so many participants so this is an humble request to the particip uh, participant to please stick to your presentation only within 8 minutes and only one or two questions according to our honorable chair we will guide about the uh, questionnaire and another uh, good, uh, request is also there you please rest it yourself only within 8 minutes and uh, when 7 minutes is completed our moderator will kindly have a gentle reminder and you please be here with us thank you and now the session the next session uh, i uh, and the hand over uh, hand over the content to our honorable moderator moderator please Thank you.
now devas gupta assistant professor apc royal government college please devas devas okay hello uh, good afternoon everyone uh, with the permission of the chairperson uh, i would like to start my presentation so let me share my video so is it there in the screen visible not visible okay yeah it's done okay so let's start hello we hear you okay so i'm sharing my screen yeah so is it visible now yes it is visible okay thank you okay so let's start so the title of my presentation is a sand mining and stone quarry in sub himalayan west bengal vulnerabilities and threats okay. so so uh, by sand mining and stone quarrying uh, it refers to the extraction of sand and stones from the earth's surface and uh, here sub himalayan west bengal refers to terai and western doers region where terai falls under darjeeling district and doers include some parts of uh, both darjeeling and jalpaiguri districts so i uh, i start with the features of the sand mining and stone quarry now these activities uh, we can relate them with three kinds of activities number one is the additional and uh, small scale mining uh, according to the oecd and uh, mmsd that is the uh, organization of economic cooperation development and mines and minerals sustainable development so all the features regarding additional and small scale mining Uh, is most appropriate with my study uh, about uh, sand mining and stone quarrying secondly uh, these uh, activities are totally uh, informal uh, employment activities and uh, i will talk about this informality later on uh, okay and again this activity is a uh, totally uh, non agricultural activity or we say a non farm employment now let us understand the reasons for growth of these activities in the sub himalayan uh, region that is tour uh, terai and duers region first of all we have uh, two factors uh, there are uh, push factors and pull factors so in the push factors are the factors uh, which lay which uh, forces the workers to move out or to adopt the sand mining and stone quarrying activities okay so these factors are basically the agrarian crisis as we all know uh, the landlessness and joblessness okay. so due to the agricultural crisis uh, most of the people are unable to get a subsistence income from agriculture so they move into these uh, kinds of activities again landlessness and jobless joblessness is related to the particularly related to doers region where Uh, due to the failure or the crisis in the tea industry uh, most of the people are joining or uh, going for sand mining and uh, stone quarrying activities okay. now the significance of these activities uh, uh, first of all these ingredients uh, extracted for sand mining and stone quarrying that like uh, sand and stones are the very much important and vital ingredient uh, ingredient required for the construction uh, construction industry without which uh, no development or construction activities can take place uh, secondly uh, 
these activities have seen to provide an alternative employment opportunities for the poorer section of the society and the displaced workers from basically from the agricultural field and tea industry in the case of doers. Okay. So this activity is uh, easy to entry for all, for the for everyone. So whoever has can want to join the activity can join themselves. Okay, there is no restrictions. So as you can see uh, here, the pictures. Uh, these are the tools used for the activities, mining and quarrying activities. So we can see here these are very traditional tools. Uh, there are no technology involved in it, okay. and it is labor intensive. Now, uh, so let's talk about the objective methodology of the presentation. So I have only uh, two objective. So one is threats posed upon the environment and the ecosystem of the surrounding areas. And uh, the methodology I followed for the research work is uh, seen in the, you can see the field visits, uh, focus group discussions, personal interviews, and all the data uh, uh, I refer to are collected from various mining authorities. Now, it is very important for us to understand the uh, rules and regulations concerning the sand uh, mining and stones activities. So the sand building, uh, sand, stones, gravels are considered as minor minerals uh, in India uh, and is governed by Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Act 1957. So according to which these activities are actually is a subject of uh, respective state governments. So for West Bengal, we have West Bengal Minor Minerals Rules uh, 2002, where uh, it is written that these uh, bed, uh, materials can be extracted or collected only by the prior holding of mining lease and quarry permits granted by the mining authority of the districts who invites application from time to time through public notification. Okay. So here mining authority uh, means uh, all the district authorities uh, uh, District, additional district magistrate, uh, you can see here, uh, sub-regional land and land reforms uh, at block level, we have uh, land uh, block level land reform officials. And these are all appointed by the governments. Okay. Now, here, uh, let us try to understand the uh, process of mining activity. So here, from the mountains, I can, you can see here, due to the rain, there are soil erosions takes place and all the bed materials are transported to the terrain and doer region that is in the plain areas okay now after uh, after granting the mining lease and the uh, quarry permits these operations are carried out uh, one they can, they, it can be done in manual operation in and another it can be done in a uh, mechanized way okay so there are mechanized operations known as stone crushing plants uh, all over the Ryan district doers uh, region you can find it out okay now from uh, manual operation and additional mining, uh, basically landless households are, and partially dependent cultivators are also involved in manual operation. Okay. Now, uh, the objective, let's talk about the first objective, which is the informality and vulnerabilities. Uh, so informal employment, first of all, uh, it is, the definition is given by uh, International Labor Organization. So it is a job-based concept. And sorry, and so, sorry for the interruption. Uh, sorry for the interruption, uh, Dr. Dupka. Yes, <clears throat> please go to your main findings because we are running short of time. Uh, yes, just sir. go for the main findings. What are your result? Discuss the result. These are things that uh, the audience tends to know, okay, or they okay. can get it from any other side. Just go to the direct, go directly to the result and tell us your uh, contribution, please. Okay, okay, okay. So actually, my objective is to highlight the informalities and vulnerabilities uh, for the employment uh, workers over uh, participating in the activity, right? So that is what that is what I'm trying to explain. So here, uh, in, form, in vulnerabilities and informality, the Kuntali, Kuntala Lahiri Datta is a, a professor of geography in the Australian National University. So she has done uh, many studies in uh, case of mines and minerals uh, communities. So he has addresses uh, the scarcity of data, right? The informal nature in almost all over the world. 
So the signs of informality that I have uh, come to know in this case, uh, in this kind of activity, this is a lack of official data. So in order to, uh, there is no official data regarding the production of minor materials. Even if there is official data, then it is very difficult to quantify the actual amount because of various illegal activities around. So we cannot get an appropriate idea about the production. Number two, there is a lack of data on employment. There are no records available regarding total employment, how many employments are uh, workers are employed in this era at official level and any other level. Number three, the nature of working, uh, nature of the uh, working condition, no uh, social benefits, there are no employment benefits, there is no fixed income of the workers. So all this nature uh, di diverts, uh, di directs the, the activity towards informal employment. Second, the vulnerabilities associated with the sand miners and quarry workers are the, the sections are already a vulnerable. Of uh, education, so the, so there are already those are already a vulnerable section of society. Right? So the take up these activities mainly for supplement supplementing their income, right? Now, these activities are labor intensive and as you can see here, this woman is trying to get the stone from the river. Okay, so it's a very, uh, very much labor intensive activity. And so all the communities that I have uh, gone through uh, in the field visits, I have seen that there are lack of improper, proper, uh, lack of proper drinking water and sanitation. They have inadequate health and education facilities. And when I ask some, uh, the one, person over there, he said that they will not be else in the mining activity if the threats I talk about is uh, refers to the employment uh, environment and uh, ecological damages. Okay. Now you can see here there are various reasons about the threats. Uh, royalty of extraction is uh, not enough to consider the external cost uh, imposed upon the environment. There are no community rights in the natural resources. So it is an action, uh, open access resource. So lots of uh, illegal activities are taking place. So that it leads to the over, over extraction and exploitation of resources. Okay, so which naturally lead to the loss of biodiversity of the region. And uh, lastly, uh, there is a mechanism, a mechanization of the uh, uh, extractive extraction activity using different kinds of machines okay. so which lead to again more exploitation of the uh, uh, natural resources and it is also leads to the threat to to the li livelihood of the artisanal workers okay. so these are the threats now lastly i like to conclude by saying that population urbanization and development of infrastructures are inevitable phenomena which will surely result in higher demand for construction aggregates but to what extent can we expand our extraction of minerals from the rivers without threatening the ecosystem and livelihoods of the river dependent communities must be identified through deep analysis and scientific study of river basins. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would request uh, Dr. Jefferson uh, to comment on this particular presentation. Uh, a very quick observation on this particular paper is that uh, uh, Dr. Dutka, it seems that uh, you have uh, gone through the literature and you have taken uh, the inputs from the literature, but um, I was just wondering what was your contribution? Uh, what was your particular value addition to this particular uh, field of research? Over to you, uh, Dr. Dutka. So actually, I am on the verge of researching this activity. So I just, uh, I, I've just calculated, I've just written, uh, read out the literature reviews and went for the sites uh, for different areas of Tarai and Duas. And okay, I, got it, got it. Yeah, so yeah. you have just started your research work, right? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Please move on to the next paper. Uh, sir, now I would like to call uh, Dr. Vanali Maiti, Assistant Professor, Ramnagar College, Vitae University, Sociology, to present her uh, speech on the topic, uh, 
COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown domestic violence against women made serious. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Doctor Bonda and Mati, are you there? Hello. Okay. So moving to the next, uh, we have. I would like to call uh, Ms. Isha Mukhtan, Assistant Professor, uh, GGDC Pedong, uh, from the Department of Sociology, to present her speech. He's going to, uh, he's going to present the abstract. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, I think uh, she's also absent. So, uh, now the next candidate, uh, participant, sorry, uh, Ms. Uh, Rup Rupam Shimaroy, from uh, Nitaji Shubhash Mahavidala, Yes, yes, ma'am. I am audible, ma'am. Yes, yes, you are audible. Uh, okay. Time to present okay. your speech. Over to you. Okay, okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Panshun sir, and respected all. Uh, I am Rupan Singh uh, from Haldivari, uh, Nitaji Shubhash Mahavidala. Uh, my uh, paper uh, uh, is on a uh, woman's voice and folklore of Rajbanshi community and analysis. Uh, actually, uh, uh, my paper relates with the uh, themes of uh, Bangla location speaking to Bhasha Bolchito and sociocultural attributes. So, uh, my paper. Uh, my, this paper is uh, seeks to examine uh, the importance of women Radhanshi folklore. Women's life is predominant in Radhanshi folk music through this uh, the image of eminent women society and women's life emerge and the story of their hopes, aspirations and joys and sorrows have been beautifully revealed. Folklore are the bond uh, of an ethnic community, the reflection of cultural details of a particular community is a very much visible through the practice of folklore. This folklore uh, constitutes an important and popular general of oral expression. Rajbanshi society being rich in, uh, in its oral literature and folklore being a part of it are seen widely and commonly used uh, uh, by the people. A number of folklore on Rajbanshi community in itself explained about the about its uh, popularity. Society plays a crucial role uh, in constructing or establishing the gender role depending upon its idea on masculinity and femininity. In, uh, in a patriarchal society, the male ideology has always positioned women after or under men and the socialization of the people. It uh, is such that if they institutionalize, they take each a every number of the society how to behave in the society by various modes and means carried by the various social institutions. The society prescribes different sets of the social norms for men and women to be normal. Uh, members of the society and create binary as a man and woman. The requirements of the society produce the content and the theme of folk music. The folk music is one of the most important verbal form that acts as an expression of uh, expression to communicate and the spirit of morality and tradition. As Marina Schaefer has rightly pointed out that folklore play an important role in confirming traditional ideas. In particular, the folk music provides use with a rich collection of reflection 
on the family body and an equally rich mosaic of the social consequence people's sexual difference have brought about in, uh, in this group. The starting point is that so, uh, focus about women through technique in light upon the worldwide uh, extending gender division of roles in life. Actually, the, uh, therefore, the uh, uh, folk music can be as an important source to understand the gender construction of the society. Therefore, the uh, present paper, actually my paper, has considered uh, of an analysis of some Rajvamshi folklore, especially the Bhavya song, in order to look at the representation of the women in the society. This paper intends to critically read how Bhavya song, which are a part of the common play, uh, act guidelines thereby, adding the society accepted notion of a woman. Bhavya is an iconic genre of folk song acting through about the South Himalayan base of Northern West Bengal, Southern Assam, and North Western Bangladesh. There is an approximate consequence that the origin of the form may be dated back to the last 16th century, giving the reason uh, of Raja Vishwasena. How to establish, establish the kingdom of Kuchbihar since the Bhavya has developed as a folk form across the plains of the district of Kojbiya, Jalpaiguri, Alipur Zuar, and the part of the Kojbiya in West Bengal, Gualpara, and Tubi in Assam, and Dinaspur and Rangpur district of Bangladesh. In the course of evolving into this, uh, it's more. Its modern forms, Bhavya has come to represent as a unique discourse on love, uh, omanism, and social realism within the uh, uh, vocabulary in Bengal, of Bengal. It is an embark that lighter, faster, and more social observation from chakra and equal integral part of the Bhavya idea. However, the popular image that the farm how I still is on this upon is on the plenty <coughs> blast that speak of love and loss and this long and omen heart. Actually it speaks recent the omen voice. Bhavya song speaks mostly in a omen voice and this has to seen in the larger context of its social evolution. How we are developed as an integral cultural expression of Rajvamshi, and these songs are composed in the Rajvamshi, undoubtedly uh, the most widely spoken Bengali dialect across this space. Despite influence, the Brahminical Hinduism, Islam, Vaishnavism, over the preceding centuries, the popular culture of this community have retained the marital influence and evidence on many concepts, folk, rulers, and practice. Actually, I present uh, the Bhavya song, uh, uh, this type of Bhavya song, uh, I feel the uh, voice of women, uh, in, uh, their sorrows, enjoy everything, etc. Uh, like a song, the question of the Uthar Patal, Karma Chale Nao, Sone, Sono Gunju, Bathine Mo, in certain songs, in the preliminary in this case, is a way to express the deep of women, almost uh, a tonic sensation of grief, but equally the very vehicle of her uh, beloved absence and why uh, sensible presence by itself. Actually, uh, uh, I present uh, in this paper uh, the voice of women. Uh, this type of uh, Bhavya song uh, reveals the women's voice 
in uh, in in in, in Rajbhumsh community. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Rupam Sinadoy. Thank you for your presentation. But uh, I, uh, the topic of your presentation was very interesting in the sense that it deals with women's voice and the folklore of of the Bengal, uh, particularly the Rajbhumsh yes, uh, yes, clan. Okay. But one personal suggestion is be is that you should have uh, gone through a PowerPoint presentation uh, because that too have made your. Uh, yesterday, 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 I prepared uh, my paper. No, uh, that's not an excuse. Uh, the fact is that when you are presenting a paper in a seminar or a, or a mm -hmm. webinar, whatever it may be, it should be a PPT uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We can move on to the next uh, paper, please. Thank you, oh, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so now uh, I will call Dr. Pitamba Chakraborty, Assistant Professor, Civilization Mahabharata, Department of Political Science, to his speech. Uh, his topic is Can the language be responsible for development or colonization of this section? Over to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the theme of my paper, I think, in my sound uh, is visible to all of you. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, the theme of my paper is the language be responsible for the development of colonization or uh, dissection. Actually, uh, I try to uh, try to focus my this paper in terms of post-colonial studies. Uh, Actually, if I if I allowing this alternative canonization, I am realized that the sound of the words denote different meaning in different contexts and for different people. Uh, then naturally, I am looking for static essentialism. Actually, in the other words, we build up some kind of provincial meaning of the subject. Obviously, following post-structuralist like Derrida, we cannot think. Of one an authentic perception of any word, and also suppose the that any absolute definition is an essential challenge in its very nature. Therefore, it is firmly necessary to clear the sense in which the metaphoric narration used in this particular presentation. Actually, uh, and the history which means that the during the colonization, language was used as tool by the colonizers. To influence the people, which help them to rule by aiming of strengthening their political base on colonized minority groups. In some cases, colonizers systematically prohibited native languages. Thus, this matter is formed with the aim of sovereignty in terms of cultural and metamorphous minority nation and the best. And the most effective way to enter in this arena is the way of language. In one hand, extending eminent language, which involves thought, belief, culture, myth, and history, and briefly all symbols and appearances of thoughts of sovereign societies, they find a method to inject and convey these thoughts and cultures. In other hand, Little by little, by imposed culture and eminent language, it is tried to lingual and cultural erosion in the minority nations. Knowing the importance of cultural and lingual sovereignty, they in fact try to convey their culture, thoughts, beliefs, and customs through language proportionately that they extend their military sovereignty conquering countries and their national wealth. Therefore, they isolated cultural resources in addition to plunder natural resources. This point, in fact, categorically presented by Franz Hannan in, uh, in his writings. According to Anthony Gramsci, actually I am quoting Anthony Gramsci, that language dominations actually highlight two specific situations. If the ruling class start a slow and 
glitin movement in a creeping layer like language and culture and in contrary low level of classes choose a natural and unawareness situation through their declination to common mate culture and according to him they show their companion with the ruling powers and submit a soft kind of sovereignty naturally they collaborate with them in their shelter metaphor metamorphosis and speed of cultural assessment second situation is a rough process of superior classes an active and with awareness reciprocity on behalf of subordinate classes which because of cultural differences and wishes as well as criterions in conformity in two sides lead them to mental even military struggles what is important in this case the role of language is giving identity in removing removing of it now what was emphasized until this part of my presentation is based on a rule that was applied by sovereignty to direct penetration in to occupied nation through language although it is partly true and partially also wrong scholar like edward said following poco believes teach that power and knowledge are inseparable the west actually claim to knowledge of the east gave the west the power to name and the power to control this concept is essential to understanding of colonialism and therefore recognizing the tendency of post colonial epistemology accordingly performing predominant discourses colonialists attempt to create domains of knowledge that stabilize power relationship and preparing basic reciprocity attempt to show the aggressive domain as positive ideal and we can pull as sentimental unwise and foolish kind of pull nonetheless many of post colonial thinkers believe that the damage caused by colonialism in terms of cultural changing a lingual and technological invasion not based on necessities of time and people's mind but based on ultimate wish of domineering nation in all aspect of cultural political and economical to power civilization they instead to show a type of emphasis on insider culture and language and make public their a divisional divisional image of themselves in this condition it is natural that they try to penetrate slowly into a colonized societies through language and beyond doubt in this respect the literature will remain the higher effect than any kind of martial invasion and it will have very effective and despoiled tools consequently there are obvious different reaction developed in the societies of colonies the most powerful reaction can be creative this obedience that consists of refusing others language and culture scholar like friends fanon considered national cultures among them national literature as an important tool to fight to gain political independence and believe that cultural independence and political autonomy are two faces of a same coin thus by way to conclude my presentation it may observe that during reciprocity process that means the subordinate or superior language play the main role and each of two sides of superior and subordinate enjoy of potential facilities of language in the meaning of cultural power and change in one hand colonialist represent its culture art and thought in the other one hand in another hand the other's language and energy is impressed by culture and custom in an unwished way in this meaning language is also a colonialist and is imposed on conquered nation more than any other matter and prepare a background and motivation for most unwished problems and currents 
and also it is a defensive tool for conquest nations to affirm themselves by applying it and keeping their identity. The colonialists attempt to incline the subordinate nations to their culture's language more than ever and force them to imitate. But as we know, imitation always is pretense of their original and somehow it is a definition of the origin. It is similar to it put, not the same. That is why Homi Bhava, a scholar, post colonial scholar, very real scholar, Homi Bhava, believes that imitation process aims to weakening the colonialist spirit of self confidence because imitation is more or less strange and altered process that compared the nation follows compulsory or optional to imitate and repeat the thought and discourses of colonialism. In this process, colonialism finds itself in a mirror that slightly became altered but in an efficient way and gives its own identity to another in an imaginary and problematic perspective. But what is it to this nation is not its identity and language, but in terminology. Mostly the same, but not exact. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Titanko Chakraborty. Thank you for your presentation. But uh, again, uh, I have uh, uh, what to say, reservation in the sense that why don't you give a PowerPoint presentation? Uh, because uh, without this uh, sort of audiovisual uh, aid, uh, it may less impact on the audience mind. Okay, that's number one. And number two, uh, just think over uh, the conflict between uh, language as a tool of colonialism and, and the conflict uh, with the native language. Okay, you haven't uh, touched upon that particular issue. So you uh, you can think of it in that line also. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chakravarti. We can move on to the next paper. Thank you, sir. Moving to the next, uh, I would request Mr. Pandit Sharma to assistant professor, Aviation College, from the Department of Geography, to present this lecture on the topic transformation in traditional Kurao livelihood, a study from selected forest villages in Antigua. Over to you, sir. Am I audible? Yes. And my screen is visible? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, a respected chairperson, host members of APCR Government College, and my co-participants. Myself, Parthudash, Assistant Professor, Department of Geography, ABNC College, Kuchbihar. I am going to present on the topic Transformations in Traditional Odao Livelihood, a study from selected forest villages in Alipurduar district. Odao's, uh, Odao myths trace their origin in Konkan coast of Maharashtra, then they migrated to Rotasgarh and then to Chotanagpur and lived for centuries with Munda people. It is where they developed their ethnic Odao identity. In late 19th century, European planters forcefully brought a large section of them to the Duwars Plain in the eastern Himalayan foothills to serve as cheap labor in the newly formed tea gardens. Now, this immigrant Urao population in this new physical and socio cultural environment started to live with Mongoloid Rava and Rathbongshi people along with Bengali master class. The last 150 years has led to socio social and cultural exchanges among these communities, which has resulted in many transformations in traditional Urao livelihood. The present paper uh, study aims to identify such transformations among rural communities in forest villages of Duwars region. So, uh, for this particular study, two forest villages, namely Kurmai from Chilapata Forest Pit and Bania from Bania Forest Pit of Alipurduar district, have been selected. These are majority Rava villages uh, with considerable number of rural population and a small Bengali population, and thus. This village is ample, these two villages have ample scope of cultural assimilations. Now, uh, my objective, uh, objectives are a brief introduction to their demography and economy, 
in these two villages and uh, to identify their essential the essential traits of Kodo culture that separates them from their neighbors in doers and to examine their uh, the changes in traditional Kodo livelihood uh, of forest living Kodos in the study area. Uh, to conduct this study, uh, uh, three stages of pre-field, field and uh, post-field works were conducted. Uh, uh, firstly, we, I selected the villages of Purmaya and Bania uh, with Kodo population. Uh, studied uh, different uh, literature on Kodao community and then uh, during field work, this field work was conducted in February this year when uh, the uh, COVID uh, graph was lowered and but we could not conduct ho home, house, ho home survey or door to door survey uh, rather I had, I had to depend on the uh, personal interviews with local people, the students, the working age uh, men and women and senior citizens and during post field work, the analysis has been conducted. Uh, suitable maps and cartograms have been prepared, and uh, data analysis has also been conducted. As I have already stated, that uh, it was not possible to conduct door to door surveys. Uh, then, if I uh, go to the my findings, uh, uh, you can see that uh, we surveyed 19 families from each of the villages, and uh, the Bania village is home to 87 raw persons, while Puma is home to 100 number of Odao persons. Literacy rate is found to be higher in Puma than in Bania. Similarly, more lingual varieties are observed among Odao in Puma than in Bania. Average family size remains similar, uh, 5 persons uh, per family in both villages. And all the Odao from both villages profess to be Hindu by religion. Uh, then if we uh, go to the economical uh, setup, uh, then it is that uh, there is prevalence of poverty among Odaos in both villages who are mostly associated with farming followed by forest product collection and working as wage laborers. Uh, as you can see that uh, there is a considerable uh, number of uh, families living below poverty line and uh, particularly we found that in uh, Bania male members of the family have uh, left their homes and uh, uh, go to other places as migratory laborers to earn their now, uh, here uh, I am to the uh, main uh, topic of my uh, theme of my research is that Odaos have historically adopted traits from their neighboring communities, like they learn village organization and spirit worship from Mundas in Chotanagpur. Those who were brought in tea gardens in the late 19th century were essentially animistic in their belief, but over the last one and a half century, most of them have shifted to Hinduism or Christianity but they have continued with their traditional customs and rituals. Here are some unique uh, social and cultural traits that distinguishes Odaos in Duars from their neighbors. Uh, if we go for the social behavior, we can see that uh, their uh, language is Kuru, uh, that is unique in the uh, neighborhood. They practice a pra patriarchal society. Uh, they are monogamous uh, in marriage. They are divided among exogamous totem totemic clans. These totemic clans are based on some based on some natural uh, object like a tree or a any or an animal, and they are not allowed to marry within the these these clans. Uh, they used to practice hunting, and the, their villages are presided by the Mundal or Mahatu. And if we go for the, their religion, uh, their unique religion is known as Sarna Dharma, and they used to worship Dharma. Uh, uh, worship Dharam and Dao Deuti deities like this, their traditional deities. They used to observe the rituals of Dandakata in uh, during crop harvest or marriages and funerals. The Kodom Puja, it's the, both Kodom and Jitia are plants. Uh, uh, this Kodom Puja is conducted by the uh, unmarried girls, while the Jitia Puja is conducted by the married woman. And this is uh, only this only happens in within Ura families. Uh, now, now the religious matter of the Odao uh, villages are presided over by the Pahans and the unique their unique festivities include the Sarhul festival when uh, the Shal tree flowers and also the Fagu festival that we call Holi or Dol in our uh, culture and uh, they used to drink um, the syrup of Mohua or the liquid from Mohua tree uh, while living in uh, Chotanagpur region. Uh, now these are the unique traits that uh, they are defined our Odao culture. Now, here are my findings uh, from the study that there has been transformations. Uh, uh, these transformations include uh, those in 
social behavior like the usage of kuruk as mother tongue has been reduced and the lingua franca uh, of sadri has been adopted by majority orao people orao continue with their patriarchal society and monogamous practice out of their totemic clans that is related to some plants and animals as i have already mentioned hunting has gone obsolete at, as the forest rules restricted we all know a uh, role of mohu uh, role of mahato as village head has been reduced over time and hindu ram brahmins are found to be replacing them uh, orao are more readily adapting to hindu customs particularly in these two villages where all profess to be hindus and they are calling brahmins uh, during their uh, festivities like marriages or other events uh, now in case of religious uh, behavior all orao families in the study area profess to be hindus no one found to be uh, performing their uh, original animistic belief uh, now they have uh, replaced their original deities with hindu deities uh, but they have but uh, strangely they have continued their belief in sarna and sarna is still worshiped within uh, households and during sarhul festival and the rituals like dandakata also continues uh, during the harvest season or uh, during marriage or funeral activities a married women are still practicing found to be practicing jitia puja within the household but practice of karam puja uh, have been uh, drastically reduced among unmarried girls almost uh, 10% or less uh, uh, the students or teenagers uh, uh, told that they used to do this uh, karam puja uh, others uh, did uh, say they didn't don't do it the village priest pahan has been uh, again replaced by the hindu brahmins and in case of festivities uh, we observed that uh, i observed that in the sadi area sarul festival is still celebrated but it has been reduced in scale fagu festival which is famous among the chotanagpur uh, those orao in chotanagpur is totally absent in this sadi area and drinking of mohua tree uh, has been replaced by hariya or rice beer as the mohua tree is not present in the towards region so uh, for my concluding remarks i can open that uh, uh, from my study that orao traditions of folk life have modified over ages they are more rapidly ch changing with expansion of infrastructure mass media and higher education within these uh, uh, forest villages uh, which was secluded uh, maybe two decades back but now with government initiative uh, improvements or development uh, uh, growth is happening there uh, uh, now wide variations exist among Uh, the orao living across social strata in terms of their attachment towards traditional language society rituals and customs this uh, folk life uh, uh, or practices uh, is found to be diminishing upon up the social strata the orao youths are more ali found to be more alienated from their traditional folk living and the unique traditional orao livelihood that used to identify an orao person separate from their neighbors are getting marginal marginalized among orao tribes Uh, so these are the references of my work thank you uh, thank you dr patodas thank you very much it was a very good uh, illuminating presentation uh, i don't have any question on it uh, we can move on to the next paper thank you sir thank you sir so moving to the next uh, now i would request Ritupurna Khan, Assistant Professor from Bihar Nagar Government College, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Department of Geography, to present her lecture on the topic Keep Coat Spotlight of Eco Feminism. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Chairperson, sir, with your kind permission, I'm starting off with my presentation, keeping sure. the paucity of time in mind. Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. Are the slides visible? Yes, it's perfectly visible. Okay. Please put on the slide show on. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Shipko, a spotlight on ecofeminism. 
In introduction, I'd like to quote Gandhi when he says, Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not every man's greed. Chikku is a Hindi word which means to stick to, to adhere, or with a more affectionate feeling, to hug other. And obviously it was more reactionary than radical because it was based on Gandhian ideologies. The origin of Chikko can be traced to the ideologies of Vandana Shiva, eco-feminist Vandana Shiva, where she says that it is traced to the sacrifice of a group of women by led by Amrita Devi, an ancient Vishnoi community little girl of Rajasthan, who protested against cutting off Khejri trees against the king and his kingsmen there. And according to this ideology, the Chipko women came forward many years later. According to Shiva, again, the credit of appropriation of Chipko essentially is vested upon Amrita Devi and later to the women more than a few men, though who were the pioneers like Sundarlal Bahuguna or Chandi Prasad Bhatt or Dhum Singh Negi, because the true leaders are the women. This is a map of Uttarakhand and the rainy village. Physiographically, it is located in Garhwal region, Dadan, Uttar Pradesh, in the Indo-Tibetan border, and it is essentially earthquake prone with undulating terrain, erosive rivers and valleys are unsuitable for agriculture. And the principal watershed for the fertile and highly populated indo gangetic plain is found here. It is a wide mixed zone of monsoon forest tracks. No wonder the economy is mixed with a mixed ba basket of pursuits from agriculture to commercialization of forests to population, um, uh, population uh, especially the male population uh, engaged in outside employment. And gathering and other uh, ancient activities are always there. Now, leading to commercialization of forest and increasing population growth, the forests are dwindling and it is making it difficult for the female folks to meet up with the daily course. And the income from the forests are also decreasing. The women are the primary caretakers because men are emigrated outside due to joblessness. The main objectives are to highlight the marginalization of women in the Dade Peasant Society of Garva Himalayas, to find out the role of women in projecting their environment and protecting their environment and to portray the significance of eco-feminism. The activities that took place were a series of demonstrations and mass protests. There were varieties in methodology. They included Gandhian activists, like Sar works of Sarla Ben, Meera Ben, Sundarla Bhaugana, Vimla, Chandi Prashad Bhatt, members of forest labor cooperatives and leftist students. Pioneer and the most promising among them was Gaura Devi, no wonder. There were variety in participation from mass mobilization to tree hugging and confrontation of axemen who came to cut the trees. There were panorama in the ideology which were valiantly painted from peasant appeal to moral economy to a path towards a green earth to an explicitly ecological and feminist movement that was concerned with social justice, political democracy and reformation of local agriculture. This is what actually happened in Chipko. So this is actually what happened and Gaura Devi took a leading role. We can see in the findings that over the last several decades, wood collection became difficult due to deforestation and over commercialization. Forest time increased, which increased the hardship for women. There were retreat of forest cover and access to basic necessities were hampered. Long-standing out-migration out out of Himalayan men, the uh, Women became the sole caretakers of the forest and their village and whatever happened in the forest, the owners came on the women. And Gauradevi recounted and women became more conscious of their rights also. Because with rights came challenges which they had to face solely. And Gauradevi recounted, it was not a question of planned organization of the women for the movement. Rather, it happened spontaneously. Our men were out of the village, so we had to come forward and protect the trees. 
we have no quarrel with anybody but only we wanted to make the people understand that our existence is tied with the forests moreover it's an issue of ecofeminism as ecofeminist sherry ortner states since it is always culture's project to subsume and transcend nature and women are considered closer to nature due to their physiology social roles and psychic structure then culture would find it natural to subordinate them according to vandana shiva's ideology rural women are embedded in nature they are custodians of prakriti and they are taken to be the icon of shakti that cosmic or cosmos power and obviously they are, they it's their uh, ideology is their role and prakriti seeks to nurture and maintain the harmony of forests as a life source from this men and industrial cultures are alienated and it must be recovered and obviously there should be a displacement which is triggered by masculinist and reductionist viewpoints and sundaral bahuguna stated we are the runners and messengers the real leaders are the women and the result in the 1980s were havoc there were huge diffusion of ideas of chipko movement in india as well as all over the world uh came into limelight the women's realization about their own power they became more conscious because they had to face a number of challenges it had a success as an organized effort in 1987 it was chosen for right to livelihood award again i'd like to go to sherry ortner where she meant and she stated that this women nature connection is an alignment of women with culture and this is the cry of the hour to ameliorate this subordination this is a photo gallery of the activists from chandi prasad bhar to gora devi vandana shiva the male leader sundarlal bahuguna they were the chipko volunteers this is the way they hug the tree to save them from x men and these are the meetings they used to held sit together and held at the mandalas in conclusion it can be said that several beneficial outcomes were there but little has changed in terms of gender equity only a few female members still date are found in forest management committees the percentage is 3 to 5% little account to women's councils in all male village panchayats sometimes women form informal groups for protests and demonstrations but it only adds to their burden and responsibility there is no increase in women's authority so women hardly have any local standing so who is there to listen to their voices till date is it is an issue the problematic nature of ecofeminist portrayal of chipko is unintended consequences which in fact could damage the very cause they sought to valorize there are many facets of the movement and they have too complex to have an entirety because till date it lacks an universality though it it could have been a more stronger and more effective movement if it would have been done more wholeheartedly and with a more entire approach and there are shifting quality of our actions motivations and intentions because it was a rhetorical tool but then more is yet to be done and these are the references with which i have worked on for this paper thank you sir uh thank you very much dr yutuban uh, khan uh, yes, sir i'm i'm not a doctor i'm just okay, miss yutuban khan thank you sir uh, yutuban uh, thank you very much for revisiting the chipko movement and bring it it uh, a fresh in the mind of the audience thank you very much thank you uh, we can move on to the next paper please thank you ma'am uh, next speaker is ram kanai shingo assistant professor kaliyaganj college uttar dinajpur in philosophy Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, am I am I audible, sir? Am I audible? Yes. Uh, I am presenting my screen. Is it visible? Yes, your screen is also visible. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. A very good afternoon to our uh, to our respected chairperson and uh, all of you. i am going to present on the topic women empowerment in the light of vivekananda's thought actually this presentation uh, help us to create a bridge between the philosophy of swami vivekananda with present day society first of all uh, there is the word empowerment in the title of my presentation so a uh, question arise in our mind what is empowerment and why it is associated uh, with 
uh, women. Actually, uh, we know empowerment is nothing but giving an opportunity to show anyone's capability and provide a required help. We know uh, empowerment has a different dimension in social system. It gives people to handle their livelihood and perform action in social process. So it means uh, 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 empowerment uh, is related to uh, freedom, which is described as to make able. More specifically, empowerment includes the uh, physical, mental, social, economic, and intellectual development of human being. Now, uh, why is it, uh, why the term empowerment is associated with women? In response to this question, we all know uh, that uh, in, the, in the Vedic period, no gender discrimination is there. All kinds of social, religious, individual rights were given to women equally as men. Even it is written on Veda that no religious ceremony can be performed without the participation of women. But gradually, during the later Vedic period, scenario began to change and women's position started declining. Gender discrimination was visible in the later Vedic period. Freedom of women is confiscated. Various rights of women were snatched and many restrictions were imposed on women. And that, that age is called as dark age. In the 19th century, several philosophers, thinks, thinkers, social reformers came out with their views and ideas to restore women's position in Indian society. Raja Ramon Roy, Vidya Sagar, Dhananda Saraswati, Mahatma Gandhi, we all know through the pages of, of history. But Swami Vivekananda was the man of different pole. The main objective of his scheme of women's education were to make them strong, fearless, and conscious about their charity and dignity. Women must be put in a position so that they, they could solve their problem in their way. At present, time has drastically changed in this matter. Women empowerment, now it has gained attraction not only in India, but also all over the world. It has been a trending issue of the 21st century for almost all the countries of the world. Presently, Indian constitution gave equal rights to men and women in all aspects. Female feticide and child marriages are illegal. In modern times, social work plays an important role in this matter. But, uh, but despite the best effort, the women empowerment movement is not up to the mark. Why? Actually, actually men and women are not able to save their empowerment. They think this freedom is, is a perversion. Women are indeed become obstacle to women's empowerment. Men are being subjugated in the name of women's freedom. One month ago, there is an incident that happens in Lucknow. One woman beat up the cab driver. Nowadays, some women use this empowerment in a bad way. Why is this happen? This question may arise in my mind, and I got the answer in Swami Vivekananda's thought. You know, Swami Vivekananda's philosophy is based on 19th century society, but it has still the same importance and worth for the 21st century. Vivekananda's view on the women empowerment are still relevant uh, in the 21st century. We know, interestingly, uh, uh, Vivekananda predicted how women should be empowered and given the freedom to attain maximum welfare of the society in the 19th century and all his ideas are relevant to the present day scenario. Uh, we uh, let's uh, think uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda what, what is the thing uh, thinking of Swami Vivekananda's gender? Vivekananda beautifully said in one line that the soul has no sex, no caste, no imperfection. What it means? This means we are different from each other in body. We see some have stronger body, some have weaker body. We are also different from each other in mind. Not all minds are same. Some minds are selfish attitude. Some have unselfish attitude. We also see that some have a male body, but a female mind and vice versa. But 
in atman we all are the same basically uh vivekananda gave emphasis on women education he said uh, 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 uh educate your women first and leave them to themselves they will tell you what reforms are necessary for them uh, here is the story uh, but uh, there is a time restriction uh, that is why i conclude here that uh, 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 as earlier i said education brings knowledge as well as ignorance but actual education cuts off ignorance and brings the pure knowledge that makes a true human being so actual education should be given to our students uh, by actual education i mean man making education by which our students become true human being whose heart feel intensely the miseries and sorrows of the world who not only can feel but can find the meaning of the things who delves deeply into the heart of of nature and understanding who will not even stop there but who wants to work out and feeling and meaning by actual deeds thank you so much thank you thank you uh, very much ramkana sinha i have no comments to make on your presentation uh, because what you have said is the words of vivekananda um, uh, i am very uh, i would be very foolish to comment on what vivekananda have said thank you very much uh we can move on to the next uh, page uh, thank you ramkana sinha next speaker is sonali chakraborty assistant professor kalyaganj college in the department of philosophy the title of the topic is influence of buddhism on rabindra literature ma'am please thank you thank you am i audible yes ma'am okay thank you yes, thank you so much yes first of all i convey my heartfelt respect to our uh, chairperson and i convey my uh, heartfelt love to our fellow participants uh, today is my topic is i am uh, myself is sonali chakraborty i am from kaliyaganj college uttar dinajpur west bengal uh, today my uh, name of the uh, paper is influences of uh, buddhism on rabindra literature uh, the national and humanistic features of the teaching of lord buddha attract the creative mastermind of tagore as uh, tagore was a believer of of the idea of humanity and worshipper of the religion of human being so naturally lord buddha and his philosophy played an important role on tagore's literature also lord buddha was a rare spirit or a uh, rare spirit who brings the people to a realization of their own divinity and makes the spiritual life as an adventurous exciting and attractive one <clears throat> for his teaching people makes the spiritual life uh, uh, for his teaching people become attracted to go forward into the world with new interest and a new bliss of heart the great personality lord buddha had a prophetic zeal and fiery love for humanity his great intellect and wisdom gave him understanding the uh, highest truth and his warm heart led him to dedicate his life to save the humanity from the misery rabindranath tagore was highly influenced by buddhism in the most literal sense after upanishad buddha philosophy had become the source of inspiration of rabindranath tagore rabindranath tagore holds buddha in his heart as the greatest of men ever born in this earth He found in Lord Buddha the embodiment of the spirit of India. According to Rabindra Tagore, Buddhism is not only the spiritual thought of ancient India, but the greatest product of India and the greatest religious achievement of man because his teachings were rational and pragmatic. Now, here I intend to focus uh, two or three specific words in a very short manner because uh, there is a time constraint. Uh, such as buddhism or humanism nibbana or uh, uh, liberation etc actually humanism emphasizes the individual and social potential and activity of human being in humanism human needs and values are more important than any other things uh, such as religious beliefs or uh, whatever it is Buddha's humanistic philosophy gave universal respect for all humanity in all over the world. Rabindranath Tagore expressed his respect to this great personality in his several works. Tagore revealed several times Buddha's teaching in his poems and novels. 
uh, in around 200 uh, 2500 years ago buddhism was originated in the northern india uh, we all know a royal uh, royal prince named siddhartha gautama was the founder of this school of thought later on siddhartha gautama was well known as lord buddha it is commonly known to us that the tradition of buddhism gets its name from a man who was identified and famous as the buddha or arakan one buddhism is considered as the first world religion which was developed in india and crossed over its boundaries by virtue of its inner strength and spiritual vitality lord buddha was the great preacher of non violence and humanism he taught his followers how to overcome suffering hunger and desire and how to reach enlightenment his great message spreads to all over the world and gradually the buddha religion became universal religion his great principle was selflessness he was praying for the misery of common people buddha religion was the first religion in the history of humanity which talked about the wonderful love and gave the services to all living beings to find out the way of release from suffering Lord Buddha was ready to give up his own life for all creatures in his view so called god and permanent self both are delusion both are only conceptual entities Rabindranath Tagore touched many buddhist themes in his poems novels short stories and plays for example the poem obishara mulla prapti mastak vikray shreshta uh, vikta etc and parishad dinodan chandalika were based on buddhist episodes and rebuild the glory of renunciation here i want to just focus to creation of tagore's uh, rubinath tagore uh, where we find the direct reflection of buddhism first one is pujarini in the poem pujarini a four dancers shrimati disavowed uh, ajata shatru order that nobody would worship the lord buddha but shrimati worshiped buddha stupa by lightening the lamp and she wanted to spread the message of love and peace by offering her prayers to lord buddha but as a result shrimati was sacrificed her life by ajata shatru's command her act of disobeying all orders of ajata shatru and going to the stupa alone to worship buddha was an act of protest against brahmanical patriarchy another thing should be noticed here that the at that time several unique female characters such as queen wife daughter are something so unusual because we see the character of the daughter shukla who was sitting by the open window reading a book of poem yes 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 i am concluding yes i am concluding that uh, poem uh, 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 and stories when shrimati entered the royal chamber and another another creation of chandalika we also see there the, there is discrimination social exclusion but uh, anando the disciple of uh, buddha he <clears throat> told that there is the uh, discrimination is only social impose it is only man made because he told je manavo ami she manavo tumi konda in this way so many things are there but due to time constraint i i couldn't explain all the thing uh, uh, lastly i want to say that uh, uh, buddhist teaching addressed human problems the human illness human suffering Tagore just took up Buddha's positive teaching, a life of commitment with love and joy, living the present moment. For him, Buddha was always non-escapism from worldly affairs. Tagore always respected Buddha's principle and values, but he never, uh, 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 he never uh, uh, takes ab the in abstract uh, philosophy of Lord Buddha. Tagore earnestly, passionately used Buddhist principle in his literature at large. He had accepted Buddha. as his model and motivation for tagore the teaching of buddha is a humanistic philosophy which gives universal respect for all humanity in all over the world which is very essential at our present day of life thank you thank you sir uh, thank you madam uh, sonali chakraborty thank you very much uh, due to uh, shortage of time we we are not taking any comments we can yes, move sir. on to the next paper please okay. uh, next one is sir hello excuse me sir Excuse me, sir. Hello, yes, myself, Doctor Bordani Maithi. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you will uh, be uh, you will present after uh, Shudika ma'am's uh, presentation. Okay, ma'am. Hello, sir. Uh, Bordani ma'am, are you uh, hearing me? Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Actually, yes. sir, we do to uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. We will take your paper, but after uh, Shudika ma'am's paper. 
wait for a while ma'am you are the last presenter okay 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 anita ma'am please a very good afternoon to everyone present over here my name is sunita lama assistant professor from the department of english apc roy government college taking a permission from the chair i would like to introduce the topic the topic of my presentation is food as a cultural marker darjeeling uh, uh, cuisine on a trail uh, so is is my presentation visible no no something is it vi visible it was visible. now now is it visible no it was visible no now now it's present yes, yes now yes yes it is it is visible now okay the topic of my presentation is food as a cultural marker edible identities darjeeling uh, cuisine on a trail so uh, identity be it religious national or ethnic is intensely bound up with food food is not just a marker of difference but a bridge which binds one culture and community with another sometimes though this identification can also take the form of a negative in the form of xenophobia and racism but for people who is living in diaspora food can be pure nostalgia and comfort food habits vary from culture to culture uh, the you know examples can be uh, food items like pizza and pasta will automatically transport us to places like italy uh, idli and dosa will transport us to places like south india when we think of butter chicken we immediately think of um, uh, you know uh, punjab so uh, indian food is generally associated that way with curries so each community or country's cuisine reflects its history lifestyle and beliefs the identification of food with certain community can also take the form of a negative in foods that are excluded for example hindus do not eat beef there is a pork ban among muslims thus food can be a political weapon what is cooking in your kitchen can also become a matter of national debate cases of lynching over beef and pork are not unheard of in news these days certain food items and food habits of certain communities can even become a matter of ridicule and subject to racism the entire northeastern people including the people from darjeeling hills are given racist epithets like momo and chowmin in big places like delhi and mumbai we symbolically that way consume identity through our food and drink choices more specifically by what we don't eat or drink eating is an intensely personal act what we eat communicates to others our beliefs cultural and social background and experiences that way ethnic identities are also expressed and maintained through dietary choices darjeeling is home to people belonging to different uh, different ethnicities apart from tea toy train and tourism Darjeeling has a rich culinary tradition and has a has a diverse range of local cuisines. Though most people traveling to hills satiate their taste buds with the ever popular Tibetan delicacies like the momo and thukpa, there are um there are other equally tasty local cuisines to choose, ranging from sel roti, kwati. alu ko achar tama singki gunruk kodoko roti etc to name a few however these food items often remain unexplored and unrated the various ethnic groups of darjeeling district of west bengal and sikkim consume a variety of fermented foods including kinema which is based on soya beans gunruk fermented leafy vegetables singki which is based on radish churpi which which comes in both the variant hard and soft milk based tama mesu sel roti which is a rice preparation and alcoholic beverages like rapsi and jar custom of serving fermented beverages to guests in this region is common and is a symbol of respect production of this primary uh, indigenous fermented food beverages of this region has remained a traditional family art 
practiced at household but sadly it's a dying art as the young generation is not too keen in learning and sustaining it fermented food beverages have a strong ritual importance and are deep rooted in the cultural heritage of the various ethnic groups of people in darjeeling hills and sikkim this local beverages like jaat and raksi are essential to solemnize marriage ceremonies of non brahmin uh, nepalis the bhutia and lepchas these beverages are offered to deities to perform pitri puja which is a religious practice to pacify family bonds even during death ceremonies in some ethnic groups fermented beverages are served and used however it is interesting to notice that these very food and beverages are used to mark insiders and outsiders within ethnic groups particularly in the context of darjeeling hills and north bengal region even the varied ethnic communities are divided into tagadhari or the sacred thread bearer and mathwari or the ones who consume the permission of the holy bearer i request uh, professor sudita lama to conclude because it's not the constant because of the constant of time i would like to just you uh, know uh, show my powerpoint presentation where i have you uh, know tried to uh, highlight the you know important uh, cuisines of the darjeeling hill this is squatty this is uh, sel roti this uh, is gundruk which comes in both the variant okay uh, super ma'am i think uh, we are done with it uh, more you uh, show us your slides more hungry will we get <laughs> so uh, we can move on to the next paper thank you for your presentation thank you so much thank you uh, our honorable chair and uh, now uh, only one uh, the last presentation from presentation pent uh, my paper entitled covid 19 pandemic and lockdown domestic violence against women needs rethinking as the world is trying to cope with the current covid 19 crisis many countries took research to stay at home orders the mandatory lockdown has been imposed to contain the spread of the virus there is a rise of instances of domestic violence during lockdown across the globe pre existing toxic social norms and gender inequalities fear and uncertainty economic and social stress restricted movement and physical isolation measures caused by the covid-19 pandemic have led to an exponential increase in domestic violence against women here the term domestic violence is used to refer to mainly from intimate partner violence objectives of this study are to examine the extent of increasing domestic violence in the context of covid-19 pandemic lockdown to analyze the factor that is responsible for the promotion of domestic violence during lockdown period to evaluate the role of prevent measures in a settlement and rehabilitation of women suffering of continuous domestic violence during lockdown to mention certain measures and policies as effective and helpful for the victims in the era of covid-19 In the methodology part of this paper was based on content analysis related to available reports and studies. Extent of domestic violence during lockdown in global global context. Taking note on the search in a number of cases, Union Secretary General expressed serious concern, stating that over the past weeks, as the economic and social pressures and fear have grown, we have seen a horrifying surge in domestic violence. Many women under lockdown for COVID-19 faced violence. where they should be safest in their own homes he appealed for peace in the home around the world since the pandemic as per un report in the last 12 months 243 million women and girls aged 15 to 49 across the world have been subjected to sexual or physical violence by their intimate partners and this can arise up during pandemic in indian context the national commission for women ncw which receives complaints of domestic violence from across the country recorded a more than two fold rise in the gender based violence during the initial lockdown period 
As per the statistics released by the NCW in early April 2020, there has been a 100% increase in complaints related to violence against women after the nationwide lockdown was imposed in March 2020. Now the area needs rethinking. In the run-up of the announcement of the national lockdown across the globe, much less attention has been paid to another pandemic that is going unaddressed, that is in domestic violence against women. Even a woman was referred to the rise in the violence against women during the COVID-19 pandemic and is accompanying lockdown as the shadow pandemic. Increasing rate of domestic violence resulting from COVID-19 is an indirect driver of economic and social crisis. It affects mother-child relationships and child socialization. The result of domestic violence can create separations and divisions where the government resources will be employed, placing another strain on the economy. The adverse effects of domestic violence on physical and mental health may range from depression, risky sexual behavior, substance abuse, to more long-term challenges like chronic disease. So the countries face losing women, productive workforce who can contribute to the economy but are remaining far away by the effects of domestic violence. Reasons behind increasing domestic violence during lockdown. Anxiety due to, due to physical confinement, economic disruption, slowed down business, Possible unemployment, times of fear and uncertainty, scarcity of basic provisions, and limited social support around the pandemic increases the domestic violence. As distancing measures, people are encouraged to stay at home. The risk of intimate partner violence is likely to increase due to additional stress and potential e economic or job losses. Women have to less contact with the maternal family with other social peers like friends, external family members, neighbors, and co-workers who can provide support and protection from violence. Working women whose livelihoods have been affected by this pandemic crisis are also now in the financial distress, which is one of the barriers to removing themselves from a violent hazard. Women are largely engaged in informal work and other vulnerable forms of employment. Now the pandemic crisis leaves them out of formal social protection. In this COVID-19 lockdown, undoubtedly liquor has played an important role in the rise of domestic violence. Mandatory stay at home rules, economic uncertainty, anxiety caused by the pandemic has led to an increase in the required adoption. In addition, work from home in this pandemic situation was driven more by compulsion than by choice. A mindset as working from home has been a difficult adjustment for me and a component which is surely as the stress among them during this lockdown. As the man demanding his alcohol consumption, the liquor outlets are proof in both above scenarios. Violence is increasing. Barriers to reporting against domestic violence in lockdown. One is physical and social isolation, another is unavailability of means of communication, risk of physical contact with the parent family, and unavailability of, unavailability of the former support. Steps to combat violence against women and governments across the world have already put the safety of women foremost while responding to the pandemic. The increase in the number of cases during the lockdown forced the French government to proclaim that they will open pop-up counseling centers and pay for hotel rooms for victims. In Italy, the government has introduced an app that is working for domestic violence service to seek help without making any phone calls. The government is also considering an offer to allocate 4 million euros for shelters for women being victims. In Malaysia, Malaysia, the government has implemented the hotline to provide proper assistance to the victims of BV. In New, uh, New Zealand, motels are offering their vacant rooms as filtered for the citizens who need to leave unsafe houses without the violation of distancing parameters. The Spanish government has told women that they are exempt from the lockdown if they need to leave the home because of abuse and both Canada and Australia have integrated funding for violence against women as part of their national plans to counter the damaging fallout from COVID-19. In India, 52 helplines are working across India to help women experiencing domestic violence which are run by police, women welfare departments, and non-governmental organizations. Some have been operational for a long time, while others have been set up temporarily for helping women during the lockdown. Now I want to conclude, as there are no questions on lockdown and physical isolation in tackling the COVID-19, but the intensity and irony behind the government's appeal is to stay home, stay safe. It fails to acknowledge that staying home and staying uh, staying safe and staying home are not synonymous for victimized women. The active measures towards surveillance and management of domestic violence needs to be an indispensable part of fight against COVID-19. Some measures are 
administrating and law enforcement agencies have to recognize the gravity of the problem and to reach women at this stage as an essential service. There is also the adequate arrangement of safe place where the victim can be shifted. In rural areas, frontline workers need to be first point of contact for average women where the panchayats and women's shelter groups have to work directly to provide safety and security to women. There is a need to regular checkups in some areas on DV issues and urgent need to circulate the numbers of protection officers as per their jurisdiction. Though social media, television broadcast, newspaper, etc., novel or nodal officers have to be appointed to attend distress call by victim by setting up area wise hotline numbers to be made function on 24 into 7 basis. Community members must be sensitized towards the increased risk of domestic violence against women during this pandemic and the need to keep in touch and support women subject to violence. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Maiti. Thank you very much. Over to the organizer uh, for conclusion. Thank you, sir. With Bonnelli's presentation, we come to end of all presentation with the conversation. Uh, now I would like to request Dr. Bhaskar Goswami, he is the respected chair professor in this session, to sum up this session, sir. Uh, well, uh, nothing to sum up as such uh, because we are running very uh, uh, short of time. Uh, to be precise, we had 10 paper presenters in this particular session, uh, out of which uh, some uh, papers are really some quality works. Uh, and I have a uh, friendly suggestion for the presenters. Yeah, um, from next time onwards, please try to put up a PowerPoint presentation because that looks attractive and also that appeals to the audience. Uh, so with that note, uh, thank you to the organizing committee for giving me the scope, I would say, for this uh, to share this session. Thank you to all the participants uh, and I uh, hope for the best. Thank you very much. Sir, actually, you are blessed by taking your time out of this busy schedule. You have spent your lot may, of time. May, 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 I, may I ask one question, sir? Uh, sure, please. Very quickly. Uh, sir, sir, myself, Mani Gupto. Uh, and my name is uh, session session one B, Doctor Malik Gupta. But I am not not don't listen my name announcement of name. Uh, this is session one A that's going on right now here. Okay, uh, please contact oh. the organizers. Well, in, uh, in that case, you just click on to your right link. You perhaps send the wrong link. Okay, after clear wave house, and then you will get your problem solved. Okay, no problem. No problem. You just click on the right key. So, uh, dear participants, we will send feedback link after uh, after this uh, seminar. It will be mailed email to you. So don't worry. And when you will get feedback, you give your audible feedback. Okay. With this, I end. I say that this session is uh, complete. So, thank you for your participation. Have a wonderful time ahead. Thank you all. Uh, hello, ma'am. I just have one question, ma'am. Okay. Hello. Oh, uh, ma'am. Actually, I am in session two A, which starts from four. So, should I remain here or should I join later? Because I'm a bit confused. Okay. Thank you. Do stay in the session room. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ma ma hello, ma'am. Ma 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 Ah, yes, if you, if Ma can I ask a question? Okay, ask. Ma'am, I am from uh, session 1B and when will we say like our turn? Session B, just B. Uh, uh, let me get proper. Okay. Hello, ma'am. I presented in this session. Uh, we will be delivered this our certificate only or we will get the abstract volume too in soft copy? Uh, you will, surely you will get your certificate. But if any asset volume, I have to uh, ask for proper committee. Okay, perhaps you will get, but you are sure to get your certificate. Okay, uh, uh, within few, how many days? Uh, can you just tell? Minimum fifteen days is required. Okay, just minimum. So don't need to worry. Oh, okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. So, okay, so thank you. So I'm running out of uh, the time, so I'll end the session. Okay. Um, those who are, please stay. Ma'am, any feedback from ma'am? 
it will be very difficult to email to you after the seminar because it is two day seminar no this is the first day yeah. after publish the second day we will email to you no no never worry okay we are with you ma'am i have a presentation uh, on the 2c and are able to join uh, should i stay here or uh, leave this group Okay, you will get your proper name. Do not wait for uh, wait. And you need to join the proper name house, and you can get the name in the WhatsApp. Okay. So with this, I end the session.
Good afternoon all. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Now we are at the technical session zero two, and in the sub session two a. This session will be chaired by Dr. Dalia Bhattacharya, Department of History, University of North Bengal. I request Dr. Dalia Bhattacharya. Department of History, University of North Bengal, to chair over the session. Madam is there. Madam. Yes, I am there. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So ma and uh, uh, regarding the moderation, uh, in this session, moderator will be uh, Professor Nobunita Pal and Shyamli Hal. They will uh, help our honourable chairperson uh, to complete the session. In this case, from the part of the organizing committee, our request to both of the participants, as well as the, our honorable chair, is that you will constrict your though it's written in the instruction, it is for eight minutes. But as we have some international speaker and speak there, so we have a time constraint. And due to the time constraint, uh, constraint. Our request is that you will approve your uh, presentation within six to seven minutes, and uh, it is an request uh, to the participants so that we can uh, mitigate the problem with time constraint. In this case, we uh, uh, want all type of cooperation from the part of the participant as well as from the viewer or uh, who are in the meeting. Now I hand over the powers of maintaining the technical session to Professor Novin Tapal and Professor Shyali Hal. Madam, please. Thank you, Arthur. Hello, no, no, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. 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 बापा दित्तू बोल बोल ची हेलो मैडम है बोल ची आमार क्या खून आ ची ए टू दी थी देखूं तेरे बाद बापा दित्तू होस डॉक्टर बापा दित्तू होस I welcome you all in this brief platform of APC Royal Government College. Now we are assembled, of course, we have assembled here for technical session 2A. And here I see almost, uh, not almost, this is clearly nine participants. First of all, I will simply tell their, your name. At least respond to me because it will be helpful for running our session. The first thing, our first speaker is Dr. Rudrashil Dotto. Sir, are you here? Dr. Rudrashil Dotto. Well, probably he is absent. Orna Mukhopadda. Orna. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, so get ready for your presentation. I'm uh, calling all first. Andan Dash. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Andan. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So you get your answer. Bapparita Ghosh. Bapparita Ghosh. I hope he is in, uh, in, in this group. Yeah. Next, Alok Sharkar. 
Alok Shalkar, Deepen Chandra Shaha, Deepen Chandra Shaha. Yeah, please. Okay. Please. Uh, uh, I, I see, I see. Uh, next, Muhammad Samimul Azim. Muhammad Samimul Azim. Next, Nisha Tamam. I know he, he Yes, yes, ma'am, I'm here. Uh, and the last participant, Royal Rai. Well, uh, we have good many speakers, so I request Dr. Rudra. Yes, I think we should start now. Who is the first speaker? Let us start with the first speaker. Please, I think she's written a part She's Orna Mukhobhata. Orna, please. Start okay, the so Sunita Lama and Dr. Rudra Shish Dutto, they are not present? Yeah, Sumita Nama has presented in another session because of some other problems. Okay, fine, fine, fine. So, okay, fine, no problem. Who is the Orna, first speaker? Please call. Or Orna Mukhopadhyay. Ma'am, you please follow the third one. Uh, Orna Mukhopadhyay. Ma'am, Ani. Hey, hey, ma'am. Start. Yeah, hey, please, please. Video on. Ani, I have to show you that. Video on. Not only that, I am Ardna आज এই আন্তর্জাতিক ওয়েব সেমিনারে পেপার প্রেজেন্টেশনের সুযোগ দেওয়ার জন্য আন্তরিকভাবে ধন্যবাদ জানাই এই সেমিনারের সঙ্গে যুক্ত সমস্ত আয়োজক ও অধ্যাপকদের আমি আজ যেহেতু সময় খুব সীমিত এবং খুব সংক্ষেপে সংস্কৃতি কিভাবে চিরস্থায়ী উন্নয়নের ধারণাকে প্রভাবিত করতে সক্ষম এবং অন্যভাবে বললে প্রচলিত উন্নয়নের ধারণা থেকে বেরিয়ে এসে উন্নয়নকে চিরস্থায়ী রূপ দিতে সংস্কৃতির ভূমিকা কি এবং তার সঙ্গে বিশ্বায়ন কেন্দ্রিক উন্নয়নের কোনো দ্বন্দ্ব তৈরি হচ্ছে এবং আদেও সেই দ্বন্দ্ব তৈরি হচ্ছে কিনা যদি তা হয়ে থাকে তাহলে তা বর্তমান চিরস্থায়ী উন্নয়নের ধারণাকে কিভাবে প্রভাবিত করছে এই বিষয়ে কিছু বলার চেষ্টা করব আমরা দেখেছি 2015 সালে সম্মিলিত জাতিভঞ্জ চিরস্থায়ী উন্নয়নের ক্ষেত্রে সংস্কৃতির ভূমিকাকে গুরুত্ব দিতে শুরু করে কারণ অনেকেই অভিমত ব্যক্ত করেছেন যে সংস্কৃতি সংরক্ষণ এবং প্রসারণ চিরস্থায়ী উন্নয়নের অনেক লক্ষ্য ও উদ্দেশ্যে উদ্দেশ্যের পরিপূরণে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ ভূমিকা পালন করতে সক্ষম যেমন পরিবেশ সংরক্ষণ লিঙ্গগত ভারসাম্য রক্ষা বা শান্তিপূর্ণ ও ইনক্লুসিভ সোসাইটির ক্ষেত্রে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ আমরা যদি ভালো করে চিরস্থায়ী উন্নয়নের লক্ষ্য এবং উদ্দেশ্যগুলি দেখি সেখান থেকে পরিষ্কার হবে যে এই চিন্তা ভাবনার মধ্যে একটা ধারণাগত পরিবর্তন রয়েছে এবং সেটি হলো অর্থনৈতিক উন্নয়নে সূচকের উপর সূচকের বাইরে বেরিয়ে উন্নয়নের ধারণাটিকে চিহ্নিত করা যার মধ্যে একটি বহু প্রতীক্ষিত ভবিষ্যতের রূপ লুকিয়ে রয়েছে এর অন্যতম বৈশিষ্ট্য হবে শান্তিপূর্ণ এবং পরিবেশগত হবে স্থায়িত্ব বজায় রাখা যদি চিরস্থায়ী উন্নয়নের মূল ভাবনাগুলিকে অর্থনৈতিক ও সামাজিক এবং পরিবেশগত এইভাবে ভাগ করি আমরা দেখবো তাহলে প্রতিটি ক্ষেত্রেই সংস্কৃতির ভূমিকা রয়েছে যা প্রত্যেকে নিজস্ব ঐতিহ্য সংরক্ষণে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ অবদান রাখে এসডিজি এর ইলেভেন এ বলা হয়েছে পরিষ্কার ভাবে যে বিশ্বের সাংস্কৃতিক ও প্রাকৃতিক ঐতিহ্যকে রক্ষার ক্ষেত্রে সংস্কৃতির ভূমিকাকে স্বীকার করে নেওয়া হয়েছে তবে বর্তমানে অনেকেই মনে করেছেন যে এই সংস্কৃতি উন্নয়নের সূচক হিসাবে অর্থপূর্ণ স্থায়িত্বকে সুনিশ্চিত করতে পারেনি আমরা যদি নয়া উদারনৈতিক বিশ্বায়ন কেন্দ্রিক কাঠামোর মধ্যে উন্নয়ন ও সংস্কৃতি সম্পর্কটিকে ব্যাখ্যা করতে যাই তাহলে তা থেকে পরিষ্কার যে সংস্কৃতির আত্মা লোক সংস্কৃতি আজ গণ সংস্কৃতিতে পরিণত হয়েছে সুতরাং সংস্কৃতির নতুন এই চলন যে কোনোভাবেই উন্নয়নের স্থায়িত্বকে বজায় রাখতে অক্ষম তা আজ আমরা অনেকেই আমাদের অনেকের কাছেই তা স্পষ্ট হয়েছে আলোক রঞ্জন দাসগুপ্ত কবি আলোক রঞ্জন দাসগুপ্ত গোলকায়ন ও ভুবনায়নের কথা বলেছেন কবির সুরে সুর মিলিয়ে যদি বলি তাহলে ঐতিহ্য ও বিশ্বায়নের সঙ্গে বর্তমান দ্বন্দ্বের ভাবনাটি আরো স্পষ্ট হয়ে ওঠে প্রসঙ্গক্রমে বলা যায় বর্তমানে পর্যটন কেন্দ্র ও স্থানীয় সংস্কৃতিতে তার প্রভাব বর্তমানে যে পর্যটন কেন্দ্র এবং স্থানীয় সংস্কৃতিতে তার প্রভাবের কথা প্রসঙ্গে 
বলা যেতে পারে পর্যটন যেমন বেশ কয়েক বছর পর্যটন উন্নয়ন নির্ভর করেছে গণ পর্যটনের উপর যার অর্থ হলো উল্লেখযোগ্য পর্যটকের উপস্থিতি কিন্তু কোভিড পরবর্তী শিল্পে মনে করা হয় যে টেকসই পর্যটন হলো কিভাবে একটি জায়গা থেকে পুনরুদ্ধার করে অর্থাৎ এক কোথায় গণসংস্কৃতি থেকে টেকসই পর্যটন বা উচ্চ সংস্কৃতিকে ধরে রাখার একটা মডেল হিসাবে বহু পর্যটন কেন্দ্র সামনে আসছে তার মধ্যে উল্লেখযোগ্য হলো মাইকোনাস এবং প্রসঙ্গক্রমে বলা যেতে পারে আদিবাসী জীবন সংস্কৃতি এবং বিবর্তিত সময়পটে অন্যান্য জনজাতির মতো আদিবাসী জীবনও কোনো কোনো অংশে উৎখাত হয়েছে নিজস্ব বাসভূমি নিজস্ব অঞ্চল এবং এলাকা থেকে স্বাভাবিক ভাবেই যারা রয়ে গেছে সেই স্থানে স্থানচ্যুত হয়ে যাওয়া প্রতিবেশীর সঙ্গে সংস্কৃতির বিচ্ছেদ ঘটেছে সংস্কৃতির অবিচ্ছিন্নতা বজায় রাখা সেখানে কঠিন হয়ে দাঁড়িয়েছে যখন কৃষক আদিবাসী চা শ্রমিকে পরিণত হয় লোক সংস্কৃতি বর্তে যাওয়ার সম্ভাবনা প্রবল হয় গণ সংস্কৃতিতে চিরায়ত সংস্কৃতি আধুনিকীকরণ ও বিশ্বায়নের জোয়ারে হাততালিপুরই চাকচিকের আতিশয্যে মোড়া মঞ্চের অনুষ্ঠানকালে প্রশ্ন জাগে এভাবে সংস্কৃতির অপরিচ্ছন্নতা বজায় অবিচ্ছিন্নতা সরি সংস্কৃতির অবিচ্ছিন্নতা বজায় থাকবে তো নাকি শুধুমাত্র জনগণের মনোরঞ্জনের উপাদান হয়ে ইতিহাস করবে ঐতিহ্যপ্রবর্ধিত লোক সংস্কৃতি ক্ষণস্থায়ী ও স্থায়িত্বের দোলাচলতাকালে কিছুটা হলেও ইতিবাচক দিক নির্দেশ করে প্রাবন্ধিক ভাষাতাত্ত্বিক সুনীতি কুমার চট্টোপাধ্যায়ের বলা কথা সুনীতি কুমার চট্টোপাধ্যায়ের কথার সঙ্গে তাল মিলিয়ে আমরা বলতে পারি তিনি বলেছেন আমাদের তাহাতে দমিলে চলিবে না যতদিন ভাষা ও সাহিত্য আছে ততদিন জাতির বা জনগণের টান ভরসাচ্ছেদিত অগ্নির মতো কোনো কারণে টিকিয়া থাকিবে সেই ভাষা ও সাহিত্যের দ্বারা জাতিকে আবার জিবাইয়া তোলা এবং তাহার জন্মগত প্রকৃতি তাহার ইতিহাস তাহার আভ্যন্তর আত্মা এবং যাহার যাহা তাহার প্রকৃত সংস্কৃতি তাহা বুঝিয়া তদানুসারে পদ দেখাইয়া তাহাকে আবার যাহাতে মানুষের মতো খাড়া করিয়া তুলিতে পারা যায় তাহার চেষ্টা করা ধন্যবাদ গুড আফটারনুন ম্যাম ভিডিওটা একটু অন করে করুন তাহলে ভালো হয় নেটওয়ার্কের প্রবলেম হচ্ছে মনে হয় 
Ma'am, dekhte ho chhod. Ma'am, kisi se bol. languages of word. The standard word order in English is subject plus verb plus object to determine the proper sequence of words. You need to understand what the subject, verb, and objects are. Uh, subject typically a noun or pronoun, the person, place, or thing. Free word order. All the languages of the uh, world have some basic or primary assumptions about syntactic typology. It generally acknowledges that uh, this order can be changed. for practical purpose uh, purposes uh, but the basic sequence is considered a primary features from which uh, other features of the languages can be inferred inferred example bengali have a relatively free word order and sanskrit has uh, free word order ekhane ekta ma'am ekta slide table diya ache jekhane dekha jacche je ग्रामेटिकल and how uh, human mind process uh, word order uh, syntactic uh, the phenomena of hierarchical uh, sim, uh, syntax are relate, uh, related to specific morphological theories hierarchical uh, structure head dependent relations and grammatical relations however according to uh, pine the theoretical types of sentence and grammar differ from the essence of past relationships cognitive explore the relationship between uh, order and mental processes or limitation when uh, describing a cognitive subjects among other things such description will consider the relevance of limited focus uh, the current state of uh, specific information in the speaker's mind and the integration or emotional development of, uh, of the various elements of information within the existing network of knowledge and pragmatic which is it in describing a pragmatic subject the speaker will explore uh, the relationship between sequence and auditory interactions uh, structure of sanskrit versus structure of bengali structure of uh, uh, sanskrit was a vedic ritualist grammarian and mimamsa philosopher the mimamsa philosopher have said the uh, order of words in uh, sanskrit depends on three things sanniti Uh, means such a um, uh, proximity akanka means uh, expectancy and jog uh, and jogota uh, mutual uh, compa uh, compatibility uh, structure of bengali um, uh, uh, simple sentence in sanskrit sentence uh, i go to school aham vidyalayam aham vidyalayam gachami uh, all word order format uh, have the same meaning ami vidyalaye jai relatively have same meaning ami jai vidyalaye vidyalaye ami jai vidyalaye jai ami jai vidyalaye ami uh 
complex sentence in Sanskrit in Bengali. I shall go to school and read books. Aham Vidyalayam Gattua Pustakam Potisami. They are uh, the two parts read with school and go with a book will never sit by sit like and Bengali. I am Ami Vidyalay Gye Boy Porbo. Uh, sometimes we cannot get the PCS meaning of some sentence in our cogn uh, cognitions after arranging the sentence. Like, uh, uh, okay, uh, okay, uh, okay, uh, significance of what order in human computer interaction, machine, uh, uh, machine reading comprehension is a challenging natural language processing research field with the uh, with white will, uh, white real world applications. The great progress of this field in recent years in mainly due to the emergency of large scale data sets and deep learning at present a lot of uh, mrc models have already surpassed human performance on various benchmark data sets despite the obvious giant gap between ex existing mrc models and genuine human uh, level reading comprehensions at a literal comprehension inferential comprehension analytical comprehension a uh, conclusion Sanskrit and Bengali can be rearranged to speak a language with free word order features. In contrast, the Sanskrit language is much more flexible than the uh, Bengali language. Despite the slight differences in word, uh, word order, it is possible for a person to write the same sentence in Sanskrit with much more sequential clarity than in Bengali without changing its meaning. Uh, this poses a, an interesting choice for researchers for choosing Sanskrit and Bengali to train machines to accept, uh, extract uh, contextual meaning from sentence with flexible word order. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Anjan, for your fine deliberation and comparative study of English Akari, Sanskrit and Bengali literature. Uh, if you have any question, if any question from the audience, you can ask. Okay, if you don't have, then we will pass on to the next, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Bapa Dikta Khosh. Sir, please. It's over to you. Makarita Ghosh, I, I hope you are in this wave group. Then I am now moving to the next speaker, Anup Sharkar. Are you Anup Sharkar? Uh, hey, ma'am. Okay, then you start your presentation. Uh, yes, ma'am. Over to you. Hello? Ma'am, I will pull one, please. Hello. Yes, you're audible. You're audible. Hello. Ma'am, you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you. Namaskar, ma'am. I'm Alok Boron Sarkar, Jadapur University of Bangla Bivagir, PhD student. Today, I'm going to start the first time with the local Ghana report. I'm going to start the first time with the local भय और भविष्य प्रसंग लोकगानर आधुनिकीकरण एन हर हमेशा देखा जा प्रचलित अप्रचलित लोकगान संग्रह कर तर भरे दो चार इंगरेजी शब्द किंबा रैपर आदले तैरी हिड़िक एस गानगुलर जान्रिक आबह अत्यंत चड़ा तीव्र तीक्षण असंमार्जित কিন্তু এগুলো লোকগানকে ভালোবেসে তার চর্চা এবং সময়ের সঙ্গে তাল মিলিয়ে আধুনিকীকরণ তাও বলা চলে না সস্তা জনপ্রিয়তা ছাড়া এই আধুনিক লোক রিমেক গানগুলির অন্তরসার শূন্য সংহার মূর্তি থেকে যাচ্ছে সাধারণের অগোচরে বিয়েবাড়ি জন্মদিন পূজা পার্বণ বা যে কোনো উৎসবে নিত্য বছর দখল করে থাকছে এইসব নিত্য নতুন গান বুঝে কিংবা না বুঝে সাধারণ দর্শক শ্রোতা থেকে হুল্লোর প্রিয় সর্বস্বরের মানুষ কোমর দুলিয়ে উপভোগ করছেন সেই সব এ যে ভয়ঙ্কর হত্যা দৃশ্য কোন না কোনো লোক সংস্কৃতি লোক উৎসব লোক নৃত্য লোক গানের কোন সার্বজনীন হয়ে ওঠার দায় নেই বিশেষ অঞ্চল সংস্কৃতি রীতিনীতির উপর ভিত্তি করে গড়ে ওঠে লোক পরম্পরা বিশেষ অঞ্চলের মানচিত্রের বাইরে তার স্বতন্ত্র আবেদন ক্ষীণ হয়ে আসে কেননা তথাকথিত এইসব লোক সংস্কৃতিকে পুষ্ট করে নির্দিষ্ট স্থানের নদী জল হাওয়া তাকে আলাদা করে নির্মাণ করা যায় না গড়ে তোলা যায় না সুদীর্ঘ পরম্পরায় গাছের শাখা প্রশাখা 
পাতায় পাতায় মাটিতে পাহাড়ে গৃহবধূদের সলজ্জ গোপন চাহনি কিংবা কৃষকের সরল হাসির অব্যক্ত যন্ত্রণা মাধুর চেয়ে এইসব নিতান্ত অতি সাধারণ নিত্য নৈমিত্তিকতার ভেতরেই তার বিস্তার বুঝতে হবে তার মাটির ভাষা অরণ্যের ভাষা পাখির ভাষা নদীর ইশারা সেই নিভৃত অলিন্দ থেকে আপন আনন্দে ঝর্ণার মতো স্বাভাবিক প্রবাহমান গতিধারায় বেরিয়ে আসে লোকগান তাকে বুঝতে গেলে তাকে আত্মীকরণ করতে গেলে সর্বোপরি সর্বোপরি সত্তায় উপলব্ধি করতে গেলে পৌঁছতে হবে সেই জীবন ছন্দের মূলে তার প্রাণের কাছে পাহাড়ের গোপন ঝর্ণার মৃদু মর্মার ধ্বনির ভাষা বুঝতে না পারলে সদ্য কিশোরীর রহস্যময় হাসির গোপন ইশারা না বুঝতে পারলে সামান্য কলাপাতায় লেগে থাকা শিশিরের দীপ্র মাধুর্যের কাছে পৌঁছতে না পারলে তাকে বোঝা যায় না আর সূক্ষ্মভাবে বললে লোক বোঝার জিনিস নয় স্পষ্ট করে তো নয় তবু যতটুকু চিরন্তন লাস্যময়ী সৌরভের কাছে পৌঁছানো যায় তার কাছে পৌঁছানোর সহজ পথ ওই নির্দিষ্ট অঞ্চলের ভূপ্রকৃতি এবং স্বাভাবিক জীবনের ধ্রুপদী স্বরের কাছে পৌঁছানোর অক্লান্ত পরিশ্রম যারা ইতিমধ্যে তার কেন্দ্রে অবস্থান করছেন তাদের কাছে তুলনামূলক সহজ কেননা মজ্জায় সত্তায় ধারণ করে আছে তার রং কিন্তু যারা বাইরে থেকে স্নান করতে নামবেন তাদের কাছে ব্যাপারটা সহজ নয় সাধনা ছাড়া সেখানে পৌঁছানো সম্ভব নয় পূর্বেই বলা হয়েছে লোকগানের লোকগান বহুজনের বহু পরম্পরায় তৈরি হওয়া সম্মিলিত স্বর এই স্বরে সংযোজন বিয়োজনের ঘটনা স্বাভাবিক কিন্তু সংযোজন বিয়োজন করতে হলে ব্যক্তিকে আগে তার অধিকারী হতে হয় অধিকার এমনি এমনি আসে না কঠিন পরিশ্রমে সাধনায় তা অর্জন করতে হয় অধিকারীকে নচেত অধিকারীর অযাজিত হস্তক্ষেপ লোকগানের শরীরে দংশন রাখে পাপ রাখে কারণ সামান্য একটি শুকনো কারণ সামান্য একটি শুকনো পাতা যে পাতায় যে বিস্ময় তৈরি হতে পারে সামান্য এক বিন্দু জলে যে মহাসাগর থাকতে পারে আঁকাবাঁকা চালের গুড়োর রেখাপথে থাকতে পারে মহৎ শিল্পের আভাস সামান্য কর্কাশ গলায় উদ্দেল নেচে উঠতে পারে সসাগর পৃথিবী এই বোধে না পৌঁছতে পারলে লোক কোনো কিছুকেই পুতি সর্বস্ব জ্ঞান নিয়ে উপলব্ধি করা সম্ভব নয় কারণ লোক এর কোনো হয়ে ওঠার বাসনা নেই দ্রুততা নেই চাওয়া নেই সার্বজনীন খ্যাতির মোহময় কুহকে হারিয়ে যাওয়ার উচ্চাকাঙ্ক্ষা নেই কেননা সে স্পষ্টতই জানে ধীর উত্থান পতন লোকায়ত প্রাণের স্বাভাবিক চলনের ছন্দই তার তার স্বাচ্ছন্দ্য লক্ষ্য করলে দেখা যাবে লোক এর প্রধান ভিত্তি লোক বিশ্বাস সেই বিশ্বাস যুক্তি তর্কের ধার ধারে না বহুকাল ধরে জীবনের রহস্যময় বলয়ের ভেতর তার উদ্ভাস উদ্ভাস সে উদ্ভাসের আলো ম্লান কিন্তু স্নিগ্ধ প্রদীপের মতো সামান্য কিন্তু স্থানে মৃদু কিন্তু স্থানে মৃদু আলোকিত করে বটে কিন্তু অন্ধকারের সমস্ত রহস্য সরিয়ে দেয় না অন্ধকারের সমস্ত রহস্য সরিয়ে দেয় না তাই লোক সমস্ত কিছুরই আয়োজন সাদা মাঠা হাতের কাছে সহজলভ্য উপচারে বিভিন্ন লোকদেবীর পূজা কেবলমাত্র ফুল পাতা দুর্বা ঘাস আলতা সিঁদুরই হয়ে থাকে লোকদেবীদের আহমরি কোনো বিলাস ব্যাসন নেই লোকগানেও তেমনি মানুষের ভেতরকার সাধারণ চাওয়া পাওয়া ক্ষোভ দুঃখ অভিমান আনন্দ বিরহ প্রকাশ পায় এই প্রকাশ পাওয়াই এর মুক্তি গাইয়েও গান কেবলমাত্র গান কেবলমাত্র গাওয়ার আনন্দে গাইলেই দুঃখ থেকে পরিত্রাণ পাওয়া যাবে কিংবা কোনো দেবাত্মা এসে সমস্ত যন্ত্রণা লাঘব করে দেবে তাও না একাকি কিংবা ছোট ছোট দলে দলে তাদের কাজের সমস্ত কাজ করতে করতে বা অবসরে কেউ গলা ছেড়ে গাইল কথাগুলো সাজানো গোছানো ব্যাকরণ আহ ছন্দমাত্রা লয় নির্ভুল রচনা নয় আমি স্কিপ করে পড়ে যাচ্ছি ম্যাম আমার রচনাটা একটু দীর্ঘ হয়ে গেছে দশ আমি 
সুসজ্জিত আলোকে বাদ্যে প্রেক্ষাপটে একটি নদীর আবহমূর্ছনা তৈরি করে ভাটিয়ালি গান গাওয়া যেতে পারে কিন্তু সে গান গান নয় নিরস অনুগীতি গাওয়ার বৃথা চেষ্টা কেননা গান তো গাইয়ের গলায় থাকে না থাকে ওই নির্দিষ্ট অঞ্চলের সীমানার মধ্যে তাই ভাটিয়ালি গাইতে গেলে নদী লাগে নদীর প্রবাহমান ঢেউ লাগে নৌকা লাগে ডার লাগে তার গোপন গহরেই তার সুর তাল লয় তার জীবন ধ্বনির সপ্ত উদ্ভাস বাউলকেও কলকাতার মঞ্চে যতই ঠেলে তুলে দিক না কেন বাবুরা সে গানের ভিতরে গান থাকে না রং চঙে ঢোড়া সাপের মতো নির্বিষ তাই জাত গেল জাত গেল বলে যতই চেঁচায় না কেন জাত যায় না মানুষের ভেতর জাতের কোন রূপ ভেদাভেদ মুছে ফেলার আবেদন পৌঁছে দিতে পারে না পুরুলিয়ার সৌ নাচও সমান মাত্রায় পড়ে আজকাল সৌ শিল্পীদের দেশে বিদেশেও কদর খুব চড়া পারিশ্রমিকের প্রলোভনে শিল্পীরাও দেদার মঞ্চানুষ্ঠান করে চলেছে আলোয় ঢেকে যাচ্ছে শিল্পের আদি সুর সৃষ্টির প্রেক্ষাপট কেননা লোকায়ত কোনো কিছুই জোরপূর্বক সম্ভব হয় না বহু জনের সামনে মেলে ধরে না আলস্যমাকা স্বাভাবিক প্রাণের কাছে তার মতো ঠিক আছে রাম অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ ভেরি গুড আফটারনুন টু অল দা রিসেন্ট পারসনস এন্ড অর্গানাইজার্স অফ দিস ইন্টারন্যাশনাল ওয়েবিনার বিফোর স্টার্টিং অ্যাকচুয়ালি মেকিং দা ভিডিও অফ এন্ড দা প্রেজেন্টিং দা ভিডিও অফ এন্ড দা প্রেজেন্টিং Is it visible, madam? Very much visible and you are audible too. Okay, madam. So the topic is uh, the North Bengal culture. What the two have another root? Now culture can be standardized, unstandardized form. uh it can have rigidity and malleability it can cover dollop and configured masses the role of education it leads to cultural preservation standardization and further improvement in tv with national and global progress thereby can facilitate the exchange of knowledge and learning from each other with intensification of educational drive this process gets further enfolded and cultural deepening takes place instead of redundancy and extension now there are some literatures uh, on this uh, role of education in cultural dissemination uh, their view points are placed here now here uh it is very lengthy so presenting in very short form according to them actually education uh teaches you uh to be uh, organized in culture so whatever looseness in culture may be there uh it can be in concrete form under proper education now this is an study uh, another literature study on north bengal actually uh, and this uh, this study was made by <coughs> an uh, made uh, under a project actually uh, from shiliguri college and uh, uh, in kolkata some universities of kolkata they jointly undertook the project and they found that actually in north bengal what is happening that the colleges the plain area colleges these are actually uh lagging behind then the 
hill part of north bengal in preservation of culture actually north bengal is uh, full of uh, various types of people uh, rava mech coach lepcha bhutia gorkha nepalis santals bangalis marwaris rajvanshis biharis chinese and their uh, various folk cultures are also there but the folk cultures these are mainly in oral form and this documentation uh, is not yet done and they found under their project study that the plain area colleges of north bengal these are lagging behind um, the hill area colleges in documentation in making integration further integration of their respective cultures now what is the objective of this study actually the objective is that a very simple objective that whether the educational drive is intensified in north bengal and whether there is proliferation of educational institutes to unreached or uncovered parts of north bengal now some uh, data were actually approached and uh, these were collected from the various uh, university websites now north bengal we know now north bengal is having more than one university and these university websites from this websites actually we got the data and uh, the findings uh, it can be uh, shown in uh, this form also that the one side that is the right side is the uh, uh, this table shows the college figures and the left side this shows the university's figures now if you closely watch these two tables you find uh, you can find anyone can find actually if some effort is, uh, is given that how many universities are there in north bengal presently you can say 6 7 like this uh, but uh, if you take uh, that they are when they were established or when these were started you'll find that before 2000 in north bengal there was only one university and after 2000 up to this 20 2021 or 20 you can say you'll find there are six universities now similarly if you come uh, to the uh, college table you'll find that in north bengal university uh, before 2000 there was 28 colleges now there are 20 uh, after 20, 2000 you'll find that 21 more colleges added gorbanga university there were 15 colleges and after 2000 another uh, 11 uh, colleges are open then koch bihar university panchanan burma they had 11 actually they started from 1888 uh, before 2000 and after 2000 7 more colleges were added raiganj university you'll find that before 2000 there were only one college now three colleges are added after 2000 murshidabad university can say it is not <laughs> you can say that it is not in north bengal but anyhow it is in between so you can somehow say that coming uh, north bengal uh, instead of middle position so murshidabad university this also started very earlier 1853 is the starting up to 2000 they had 13 colleges now after 2000 six more colleges added up to 2020 then uttarbanga krishi vishwavidyalaya before 2000 only one center were there now after 2000 up to 2020 you'll find that seven more uh, centers they have opened now this is the okay now if you find that the year gaps that after how many years uh, this universities or these colleges or these institutions are open now in case of university you'll find that north bengal university was set up in the year 1962 and up to 2000 only one university then after 2000 to 2026 universities so you find the year gap then you'll find the first university it uh, the second university came after 39 years but after 2000 up to 2020 the gap reduces mr uh, mr jitesh chandra shahar you have to wind up because yeah yeah this is the last that the last that Uh, so the now the gap it becomes 10 years now in case of colleges also you'll find that the earlier uh, the year gap between two colleges set up before 2000 it were 11 years now it is reduced it is reduced to 2 or 3 years like that 
so this is the conclusion uh, that, that the average gap years in north in years uh, of setting up new universities to new corners of north bengal is reduced by 75% after the year 2000 and for colleges this stand out uh, 60% this indicates the educational drive is intensified and there is proliferation of educational institute to uncover parts of north bengal and cultural deepening like documentation and integration in formal organized and digital world is expected to take place along with its traditional flow in unrecognized dalam now for a very easy understanding you can see this uh, diagrams let's see uh, even if you in your childhood have played this cricket in field in street now these were very short form crickets now t20 you can imagine so you can say the t20 is the standardized form of your childhood or you can say that the childhood game you played that is unstandardized so these how the educational institute actually helps in standardization in globalization in integration of your culture to the world platform So these are the references consulted. Thank you. You may have questions. Thanks all of you for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Chandra Shah. Okay, madam. Hello, madam. I am. 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 Muhammad Samimul Azim. Are you here in this web room? Okay. Hello. Uh, one important announcement uh, in our web assembly. I find Dr. Shabani Shahar, who is a eminent speaker, now invited to the session. Uh, he is here to join the group. Ma'am, can you give permission? बाप्पादित uh not to present in that moment because the session is going on you will just have a patient and we will declare when you will be a call for presentation only then you will uh present your paper right uh please okay, bear okay, with okay, us okay, okay, okay. we have with us eminent international speaker dr shrabuni shaha who is already joined with us this is our privilege to announce the name of our invited speaker i request ma'am only uh, three or four speaker uh, for presentation is there we will complete the technical session and then you will start or ma'am you will start we will then we can shift the technical session later of uh, of your uh, uh, lecture ma'am please professor sabuni shah Ma'am, uh, you are you are not audible. Sorry, I think it is better if I start now because I have other commitment after that time. Okay, okay, okay. Thank if you. that is okay. Yes, ma'am, it is okay. Uh, this is my privilege uh, on behalf of the organizing uh, secretary and the committee. I request all the presenters. whose presentation is uh, still now pending they are requested to uh, keep uh, patience so that after uh, the completion of the special lecture invited speaker uh, professor sabuni shah after that we will uh, resume our technical session so that uh, every thing can be uh, balanced in that way this uh, on behalf of organizing committee two days international multidisciplinary multidisciplinary web seminar i welcome dr shrabuni shah professor shah 
is a development and microeconomist, international microeconomist, and is currently working as an associate professor of development economics at University of Lincoln, United Kingdom. Dr. Sravanisha holds a PhD in economics from Massey University, New Zealand, Masters of Economics from University of Sydney, Australia, MSc in Economics from the University of Calcutta, India. She also holds a professional teaching qualification from Higher Education Academy, United Kingdom as a fellow. Dr. Shaha research interests are in political economy, terrorism and yeah. tourism economics, economic growth, development economics, and international trade issues. The main areas of her research focus on cause and effects of corruption across nations and corruptions also engaged in research involving political instability and its effect on tourism demands and economic growth and has published in top international journals such as Economic Letters, Journal of Institutional Economics, Economic Modeling, Journal of Tourism Research, Tourism Analysis. So many uh, publications are there. This is a brief intro introduction. And I am, uh, I, on behalf of organizing committee, welcome. I welcome Dr. Uh, Srabuni Shaha to deliver her invited speech in this international wave platform. Madam, please. Thank you. Good sorry, afternoon sorry, and... Uh, sorry, ma'am. I, I want to yeah. uh, uh, interfere only one thing. In Dr. this part, in this part, when uh, invited speaker will be uh, in speaking, then I request Dr. Prof, uh, Professor Anjan Chakraborty, a director, Professor, University Grants Commission, North Bengal University. I request, sir, to be in chair within the invited speaker section. Dr. Chakraborty is presently working as the professor in UGC, HRDC of North Bengal University. Previously, he was serving as associate professor at UGC Human Resource Development Center, University of Bordhaman. His areas of research interest are agrarian Bengal, development economics, sustainable development, and Northeast India. He has authored three books on developmental issues. He completed six national and international projects. He has contributed more than 50 research articles in various national and international journals. Apart from guiding PhD scholars, presently he has been associated with the preparation district gazette of Bardon. He delivered invited lectures in various premier, premier institute of national and international eminence. He visited Europe, Southeast countries to present his recent findings. And so the list is so long. So I request Professor Anjan Chakraborty, Honorable Director of Human Resource Development Center, North Bengal University, to chair the session while our eminent speaker, international speaker, Professor Sabuni Shaha, is in her speech. So, Professor Chakraborty and Professor, uh, Professor Shaha. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I heartily welcome uh, Professor Sabuni Shaha, one of the leading development economists uh, from UK. Uh, she, is, she has been associated to Link, Lincoln International Business School, University of Lincoln, United Kingdom. And uh, we are really grateful that uh, she, in spite of her busy schedule, uh, she uh, readily accepted our invitations and uh, agreed to deliver the lecture. So without adding much uh, ado, so I'll request uh, Professor Shraha to um, uh, make his presentation. So may I request ma'am to uh, confine a lecture to 40 minutes and maybe the another five minutes or 10 minutes we can uh, devote for question and an answer. So you are welcome ma'am. Thanks Anjan. Uh, good afternoon and good evening everyone in India. Firstly, I would like to thank Professor Shubhiresh Bhattacharjo, Honorable Vice Chancellor of North Bengal University, Professor Anjan Chakraborty, whom I know for many years now. Dr. Moyuk Shorkar, Mr. Vishwajyoti Roy, 
the head of the Department of Economics, APC Roy Government College, Siliguri, distinguished faculty members, organizing committee members, audience, and my dear students for inviting me to this international web seminar today. I'll talk about reverse migration, innovation, and sustainable development during COVID pandemic, a case study of Indian women and children. Just a note, I'll take questions after the seminar and my email will also be there. So please feel free to write to me if you don't get a chance to ask me the question today. So is it my slide visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am, it is visible. Okay, so this is a joint work with two young economists, Mr. Shubhuman Shah, who works in uh, Shwaniti Initiative Rachi in India, and Mr. Karanpir, GST Advisory Private Limited Mumbai in India. Now, the theme of this presentation is Sustainable Development Goal and the link of my presentation is also sustainable development goal and how COVID-19 and reverse migration that has a serious threat to sustainable development goal. That is a case study with Indian women and children. Before we go to that main topic, I just like to say that sustainable development goal that is determined by the United Nations Advisory Council, that is the 17th goal to transform our world by 2030. So it is a global issue and it is not related with a particular country or particular region. Maybe we can say that developing countries they are suffering a lot of poverty as well as different aspects, low economic growth, unemployment, inequality. But at the same time, we can say that developed country also faces many challenges. And that is how social development goal, so our sustainable development goal is not only with country specific, it is a global issue. Now, if we think about that sustainable development goal that has created uh, by the big challenge by COVID-19 and pandemic, it is a twin crisis, both uh, health crisis as well as economic crisis. And again, it is a global issue because not only a single country or region are affected, whole world is affected. I just give you a very short picture, both covering like developed and developing countries. So in this slide, we can see that compared to 2019 and 20, GDP growth has reduced in developed country from 1.64% to minus 6.8%. And if we look at developing country, the average economic growth 3.62% uh, to minus 2.4%. So looking at this figure, maybe we can say developed countries suffer more than developing countries. Uh, and also we can say that country-wise, like US, the largest economy in the world, and that in terms of COVID death, COVID infection rate, we see that it is a leading in the world and economic growth that is decreases from 2.16% to minus 6.1%. And other, UK also suffer a lot. And in terms of growth, we can see that it also has decreased a lot. Now, some countries in Asia, China, India, Hong Kong, Vietnam, we can see that all countries, especially in India, that during COVID-19, 
uh, in 2020, the growth rate decreased from 4.1% to minus 3.2%. And Vietnam, 7.2% to 2.8%. Uh, Africa, again, we see that minus 6.62% to minus. So we can see also Latin America, Brazil, 1.14% to minus 8%. Mexico, minus 0.5% to minus 7.5%. So this figure shows that the economies in the world, so whether it is global south or global north, everywhere affected. Now, because it is a global issue, we can see that in terms of export and import, because first impact is when that stop of economic activities, lockdown. So we see that movement from one country to other country, especially during that globalization period, export and import are the vital to the countries. And most of the countries we can see, say Hong Kong, they are export 188%, import 187%. Vietnam, Again, more than 100% export import. In comparison, US say 12 to 15% that export import. UK also heavily relied on export import. So most of the effect that we can see, those countries heavily relied on export and import and their economy, even not because we can see a lot of Asian countries, those who were not affected during the first wave of the, of the COVID, that means health-wise, they were not so much affected, but economy-wise, they are hugely affected because of this export-import reliance on these countries. And due to COVID, the stop of activity or movement from one country to other country, that those countries faces a major impact. And in terms of industry-wise, the because of because stopping that economic activity, we cannot go to work directly. So most of the impact we can see that industry sector. That industry sector like UK 19%, uh, sorry, UK 20%, US 19%, China 40%, industry sector and manufacturing, Angola 61%, uh, Algeria, that is 39%, Mexico, 32%. So we can see that industrial sector, they have seen a massive loss in the output and production and in terms of employment. On the other hand, service sector, those country, because this COVID pandemic has less impact on service sector in that sense, because we know that the concept came out working from home. So working from home saved employment and job for the service sector where we don't need to like our education sector, university. We are doing last one and a half years, we are doing everything online. So those sector where it is possible to work online, they are not that much affected, but where physical, Presence is important, like manufacturing sector. And there we see that most of the losses. And again, employment in the industry, especially in the manufacturing sector, they have seen the most of the unemployment. Now in the second slide, we see in the Indian case, because India was not that affected in terms of health wise, health issue like pandemic, but in the second wave, we can see that it was tremendous spike during that February, March, April, and even much, much higher than the world rate. And especially in that region, we see that Nepal also. So why is that crisis is economic crisis, mostly border closure, so goods cannot move from one place to other places. 
So we can see how the supply chain work. So how the country is related to each other. And that is the good thing for globalization. We can see that even we don't need to present, but we can, or even the country cannot produce, but we can get everything. And because of the supply chain, and when COVID restriction or border closure, that movement of goods and services from one place to other places hampered heavily. And that is how even health crisis is not that high, but economic crisis really, really very serious. And even as I said, US is the number one country in terms of size in the world. They have seen also very, so first and immediate impact is unemployment. We can see last year, March, April, US unemployment was 15% uh, or close to 16%. So that is a huge one. Now, if we go back to India, what is the specialty? Why our study is looking at that? So in India, we have seen a national lockdown from March end one month. And that has a serious impact on migration because India uh, regional migration is very prominent. So movement from rural areas to urban areas. And another most important issue is there, India, they exist a huge volume of informal sector. And we know that informal sector, there is no security or whatever the government policies, they cannot avail it. So this impact has especially women and children. So that is our motivation. And in terms of if we look at population size, India is 1.3 billion population. And in terms of world comparison, it is ranked number two. And we are expecting by 2028, it can overtake China's population and it can reach to 1.45 billion. So the majority on the earth in future, they can reside in Indian subcontinent. Hence, it will act as a pool of labor supply for itself and the rest of the world. So that is one advantage for India, like population and labor force and young population, which is most of the developed countries now are suffering, even China, aging population. But India has that advantage. And the world's biggest adolescence population, 253 million. One in every five people aged 10 to 19. So that is a very good figure for prospective Indian uh, growth and young population, labor supply, labor force, contribution to output. So if these first number of teenagers are safe, healthy, educated, equipped with information, life skill to support the country's future development, India will benefit socially, politically, and economically, and they can reach that sustainable development goal. But what we have seen is that Total labor force during COVID-19, there is a huge loss, 4.66 percentage. That means it reduces, reduction is 471.68 million from 494.73 million in 2019. So it is a huge loss in labor force. And the pandemic induced lockdown and economic downturn reduces the total labor force by staggering 23 million. And very interesting that this 23 million is equivalent to the population size of Australia, which is currently 25.68.
in 2020. So we can see that looking at the figure, we can see that what a loss that this pandemic has made in the labor force. And again, loss in employment, including migrant labor, both formal sector and informal sector. So approximately 450 million internal migrant laborer who make up disproportionately a very large share of the country's informal economy. And especially informal sector, they see that low skill internal migrant who relied on daily income and they are the hardest hit by this pandemic. So thousands of migrant workers, because of that sudden national lockdown without notification, and those who migrated from rural areas to cities, they were stuck with no food uh, or very little food, poverty. So again, including women and children, well, left with little alternate but to track hundreds of kilometers back to their native places. So it was a huge focus by the media and even policymakers to everyone because they are suffering. And definitely we can see that impact of COVID-19 pandemic on this reverse migration because migrant in the informal sector, these migrant mostly dominate by women and children. And what are the policy evaluation and what could be done to meet the sustainable development goal because COVID-19 pandemic poses a serious threat to sustainable development goal. So if we look at that table, so it is the migration status in India, say according to the last census 2011, total migration is 455.7 million. And out of that, we can see that female percentage is 68%, that is 309.6 million. So compared to male, female migrant dominate and they are much, much greater, maybe more than double than male. And in terms of male age 20 and above, we see that it is 22%, but female age 20 and above is 58%. And this include children as well, which is again 20%, very close to male percentage. And growth of child migration during that period 1991 to 2011, we can see that increasing child migration is around 36%. So, which is much higher than interestingly, we see that increase in child population is 18.5%, but increase in child migration is around 36%. So again, it is more than double. And increase in child population that is 2001 to 11 is 6.3% and increase in child migration is 54.3%. So we can see from 2001 to 2011, what a, an increase in child migration as well. So definitely this poses a very, very high concern and how they, have, they are affected by this pandemic and that started in 2020. Now, Indian, so what is the problem? Problem is lockdown, because we know that the cure of this uh, COVID pandemic is if we can stop going to the outside or maybe work or outside mostly, then we can stop the transmission of infection. And that is how that lockdown. So lockdown means no work, if we need to go to workplace to work and lockdown means it is a stoppage of economic activity. 
So the first impact is job loss. And the majority of India's migrant workforce belong to informal sector, which deprived them any form of social security. So we know that across the world, most of the government, or we can say every government, they try their best to help people uh, due to their job loss. But this kind of help, it only goes to that formal sector, not the informal sector, because it is difficult for government to count for informal sector and their activity, their contribution to GDP. So the migrant population started evacuating Indian cities. So how they can survive if they based on daily income, daily wages, and if there is no income there, then how come they survive? How long they can survive? So what happened is this migrant uh, worker, they started going back to their home or villages. So that started evacuating India cities using buses, truck, auto rickshaw, but mostly on food. So many lost their life due to COVID as well as in this process of reverse migration. So here we can see that when people, migrant people, they have started going back to their villages, but everything is closed. Now, government of India started 450 stomach train for returning workers. And most of the destination state, because people mostly migrate to Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Punjab. And the source state where the people came from is like our Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, that dominance. And a sudden surge in demand for work as well, because when they are going back to their villages, they also need to do something. So, so there is a huge demand increase for work in that villages as well. So in that chart, we can see that 116 districts that government have India pointed out and the return from maybe Bihar is 32 state district, Uttar Pradesh, that is 31, Madhya Pradesh, 24. So most of this state, they return back. So 28.6 to 131 lakhs during April to June 2020. So we can see that how that number increase. And this is not only in the first wave, but second wave also, we have seen that similar effect, lockdown uh, in different places. But another important cause that COVID-19 second wave and effect is on villages, because first time villages were not that affected. But in the second wave, villages were affected because these people who return to their uh, villages from cities or urban areas, they also took that COVID infection with them. So we see that second wave, that high infection in the villages. And the rural community, so that poses rural communities at risk. 65% of the COVID cases in the second wave, that is in the villages, rural and semi-rural areas. And this is a chart, it shows that India's migration women and children. So because they need to, when they are going back, they need to do something. So which sector are affected? We can see that secondary sector, they are affected due to COVID because I said where the physical presence is important. Now, secondary sector, they see that fall from 325 to 29.7% during that uh, April to June 2020. And agriculture sector, they see beat increase 0.511 to 5.9% because that people are returning back. So rural 
areas are mostly dominated by agriculture so overcrowding in the agriculture sector or maybe it happened that uh, some rural agriculture areas land because law, not lack of people supply of labor because people move to cities so when they are returning back maybe they get some positivity in the absorbing people that increases the agriculture sector contribution but on the other hand we see that tertiary sector overall unemployment also increases from 9.1% to 20.9% in the second quarter and tertiary sector that survived because we can see it is possible to work from home and in terms of unemployment rate in the current weekly status in urban areas that is the this part that shows like 20.8% 20 uh, 21% nearly 20% and above that april and june that 2020 so that shows high increase in unemployment so initially i started with showing that unemployment increase in us 16% close to so we see that similar scenario in india as well now impact of india's migrant worker so this is a migrant worker mostly they work on these this diagram shows like mining uh, mining, manufacturing, electricity, construction, trade, transport, and other agriculture. So it is very clear that this agriculture decreases over the period, say from 2019-1999. So over the time, the importance of agriculture sector decreases. But on the other hand, we can see that this blue line, which is other service sector, so service sector has increased over the time and the green one is manufacturing because India is more relied on service sector than manufacturing. So we can see that how these work are distributed in different sector and in that respect we can see that economic impact on COVID-19 is education sector is a bit low and healthcare, social care, that is low, but most important impact we see that trade, wholesale and retail, motor vehicles, so there is high, manufacturing is very high, real estate high, accommodation, food services. So these are very higher impact. On the other hand, we can see that agriculture, low and medium impact. So impact wise, which sector most affected? Like as I said in the beginning, where it is possible to work from home, those sectors or jobs in those sectors, they are not that very high risk. But where it is not possible to work from home, so those sectors are affected because of that COVID. And which is a similar case for India as well. So here in terms of children, Reverse migration exacerbated the risk due to economic crunch and uncertainties and poverty. Because these children, they live with their parents. If their parents are with, under poverty, so they also suffer the same. And poverty to be the pre cause of child labor, even 1% increase in poverty leads to 0.7% increase in child labor. So that is also a serious impact. A decrease in children going to the school leads to an increase in child labor because even child, they can do something, they are not going to school. If there is possible in, or in any way to earn some money, so they are doing that, that is how child labor increased that we have seen during this COVID pandemic. And even school open, children continuing to work for their family survival and due to lack of money. Because 
even some school open but it is difficult for parents to send them to the school because they lost job it is difficult for them to send their children to the school and also very unfortunately that we see meet the meal scheme has also been irregular so in terms of nutrition or food that also children suffer because of that pandemic and the accompanied increase in loan debt poverty might lead to an increase in alcoholism depression and an increase in the incident of domestic violence so the situation of child marriage can be exacerbated as well so all this impact we can see on the children now in terms of sustainable development goal in the context of women and children india ranked 128 position out of 165 countries in 2021 so number of goals are there so goal number 4 quality education has worsened over the years so obviously that pandemic also radically lower the situation or quality of education number 5 goal gender equality during that same period stagnates due to abysmal change in the ratio of female to male mean years of education received and also with pandemic adversely affecting women more than men because we said women the migrant women they are around 68% so their sufferings are much higher than men education employment status of women in india will further deteriorate if that continues and the only silver lining in terms of sustainable development goal 8 is decent work and economic growth and financial inclusion of marginalized section of the society because we see last few years that uh, even people in the village area they can open the bank account because if government wants to support or put money in the bank directly they can do it using that bank account which was difficult in the past so in that case we can say that india has successfully uh, reached that goal or towards that financial inclusion of the marginalized worker in the society now the question is when these migrant women they went back to their villages definitely even it is may be possible for men to get job or involved in different work but it is very difficult for the women to get job because they are more occupied with the family look caring job so here migrant women that's uh, but how we can improve that situation is strengthening women self help group so in april 2020 about 20000 self help group in india produced over 19 million mask and 100000 liters of sanitizer that helped them to get some income and to survive so that is a big step for this informal and migrant worker when they return and also addressing energy poverty in rural areas like average electricity consumption of grid connection in rural rural areas is 39 kilowatt per month which is half of the national average of residential electricity consumption so again we see the problem is urban areas their electricity consumption is much higher both in terms of household as well as uh, business but uh, rural areas they have the like poverty of energy they very less uh, electricity consumption is there and the problem with getting electricity so that needs to address as well 
And another important thing like how we can, because in, in the beginning, when I said that the most important thing that those sectors or people who can work through online. So digitalization, digital economy, digital infrastructure, that is the vital. Like you can see it is very easy to do this type of conference or web seminar. And we see that during COVID period, there are many across the world. It is much easier. We don't need to present there. But because of that digital role, we can do it. So role of this, it is in the, like we can say developed country, they provided digital uh, structure is stronger than maybe in India is very good, but in rural areas, not that good. So if we look at this type of household, urban and rural, in terms of digital infrastructure, like computer and internet, we see that urban area computer access is 14.4%, rural areas is only 4.4%. And urban areas in terms of internet is 42% and rural areas is that 14.9%. So that shows when these people, they are going back to the village, their life is very difficult over there lack of electricity, lack of internet. So even for children, lot of places we know that education through online because they cannot go to the school, so online. So it is much easier for children for the cities or urban areas, but rural areas, even at the university level, I have a lot of friends in other universities in India and I was talking to them, how is the teaching and everything going on. And it is, the situation is maybe those people or student who are, who has gone back to their villages, it is difficult for them to get the internet access and to continue their study. So this is a big problem that rural area they face. And in terms of immunization, we can see for children, that is a big risk because maybe we know that India, they continue a lot of immunization program for the children. Maybe these are very easily accessible in the urban and city areas, but not in the rural areas. So those who gone back to villages, so there has been a huge influx of non-immunized children to the rural areas of India during this pandemic. And importance in state like Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Orissa, Jharkhand, which act as a short state from where migrant worker move to other state in large number places. So when they return back, there was a big problem for children to immunize. So, and some part of West Bengal also part of the South State. So, overall, we can say that COVID-19 has impact on not a single country everywhere in the world, but India is a special case. We can see there is a high existence of informal sector and that government policies to fight that COVID-19 difficult to reach for the informal sector. And when these people return back, they face a lot of problem in terms of income, in terms of employment. So even we know that say, how if someone losing their job. So like I said, now many places we see, even in India rural villages, some places we see that, okay, people can make YouTube video and they can then subscribe to YouTube. When people uh, watch that video, subscribe, maybe that generates some part of income. 
So to do that, and in developed country, it is a very common now. But to do that, you need a strong infrastructure for it. Yeah. So, ma'am, uh, just uh, we have like forty minutes, so uh, maybe you can extend another five. Minutes. Yeah, so I'm nearly towards the end of my uh, uh, talk. So I'm just summarizing the thing is yes, yes. here the problem. That's why like women and children, firstly, they are a huge percentage, 60 or 70 percent of migrant and they are the informal sector. So they are the most sufferer in this process. And thank you. I nearly finished. And if you have any question, please go ahead. Thank you. So, ma'am, thank you for your uh, beautiful presentation. And especially uh, where the problem lies in India, you uh, simply brought uh, one by one those issues. So in that way, that COVID-19 pandemic has affected the entire world. But uh, you brought the pertinent issues, especially uh, the country like India is suffering from. Uh, you started with your, your presentations that uh, there is a um, breakup in global supply chain because that international trade got badly suffered, number one. Uh, secondly, you brought to the you brought uh, your issues back to India, wherein you told that that uh, mostly we are relying on services and as well as the manufacturing is not that uh, robust here, and uh, services as well as the manufacturing, the informal sector is actually uh, driving the uh, growth in India. And uh, since informal sector got affected, and since informal sector a large segment of children and uh, women. Uh, they are there. Uh, so the problem of uh, reverse migration that we observed, uh, that's become very pretty um, 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 prominent. And uh, that particular site uh, raised a lot of eyebrows and questions the policy making. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, you also linked it with the sustainable development goal that we are supposed to get, supposed to achieve certain goals by uh, 2030. And uh, you mentioned that especially the female, uh, uh, the gender questions, uh, the child labor questions, questions of quality education, question of uh, energy, uh, question of digital uh, divide, all those things you brought into your uh, presentation. So in that way, it's absolutely fabulous. Now from the chair that I would like to say, uh, let's say that um, uh, I think you would agree with me. India, but certainly this uh, COVID-19 uh, has exposed the Indian economy, but the recession uh, of Indian economy was, it started from 2017 and 18, India was going something around 4.2%. And prior to that, we are very happy and happily actually showcasing our statistics that India is going at 7%, 8%. Now this 7% and 8% growth actually based on the uh, informalizations of the economy. So on the one hand, we are confronting the agrarian distress. On the other hand, the Bimaru state people are moving. They are joining in the uh, informal sector, especially the industrialized and service driven um, states. And no kind of protection, uh, no protection, social security or the protections are given. So you mentioned that India may look forward for decent work. Uh, but uh, as my understanding goes that uh, um, ILO, India International Labor Organization, they told that even in the 2017-18 uh, publications, they told that almost 78.9% is the vulnerable employment. So therefore, uh, uh, certainly the COVID had exposed the glaring realities of Indian economy. But uh, these realities actually in existence for a pretty long period of time, uh, possibly that got uh, that pushed back to under the carpet because uh, we are tom toming on the growth. So therefore, and even uh, the question of inequality, the Janssen and PKT, they very clearly shown that the inequality level in India was reached to, uh, so since 1922, uh, it reached at the highest level. 
the consumption expenditure in 2017-18, especially the rural areas, the consumption expenditure has drastically fallen. So uh, these is issues are equally important and public, probably supplementary uh, to our presentation. So, so therefore, not only we need to negotiate uh, the emerging crisis that you have uh, you have mentioned, but the way we have uh, uh, unfolded the economic reforms uh, uh, almost now and three decades uh, it's over. Uh, we need to relook re at the. Uh, that the, the different different uh, arenas of economic reform that way the way it had been pushed up and uh, so far my, your the global supply chain is concerned the other southeast asian countries especially they through their msmes they got into the global uh, supply chain and their economy boomed and people got the uh, employment and here uh, we failed to get into the, our msme uh, didn't get that robust uh, which can get into the uh, get into link to the global supply chain. So possibly there we are lagging behind. Mm. So these are the pertinent issues, and possibly uh, during the question and answer session, so that will come forward. But nevertheless, no, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks so, so for your beautiful presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Anjan. Uh, just one point I can make here. Obviously, we know that Indian economy has re started reformed in 1991 and especially going more towards globalization and uh, that infrastructure in terms of digitalization and role of it in the economy has improved a lot but the from the point of view that now basically those who are working in that IT industry especially in terms of female or women worker because there are a lot of odd hours that's why we can see it is difficult for women to work in that odd hours so maybe that is how we can see that the involvement or employment or labor force for the women has decreased in 2000 after 2000 and maybe like you mentioned uh, 15 16 17 this is one of the major cause because IT call center, there is no time limit to work. So that odd hours, that basically has negative impact for women. They are losing job for not only because of COVID, but previously. But for informal sector, we know that women, they maybe go to move from their villages to that urban areas as a, when they are getting married. So they are moving there. Maybe they have not that skill, but more, uh, a big percentage of them, they work as a maid servant. So when they work as a maid servant, at least they can earn some income. But because of COVID, that basically stopped that job as a maid servant. So there is a big loss of income for this percentage of the women. I think that is a very high percentage, like hotel, restaurant, uh, that hospitality industry, that is, uh, we can say that totally destroyed during COVID. And that is one of the reasons that why women, they suffer a lot. Absolutely, madam. And uh, one important thing that I observed, uh, and you will be completely in agreement with me, that uh, the policy intervention during the COVID period is mostly supply side intervention. And here the problem yes. lies it at the uh, demand side because people, uh, they do not have the income. So demand become absolutely uh, claustrophobic. Yes. So until unless there is a revival of demand or direct state interventions uh, to, for, to, to revive the demand, the supply chain or the supply side intervention is not going to work. So uh, yes. possibly that's the region we need to look at again. So, okay, ma'am. I, I think now uh, we should leave the platform for the question answer session. Yes. Uh, so, you, uh, the participant, you can raise your hand so that uh, we can take up the questions uh, one by one. Uh, so your question should be brief or you can put it in the chat chat box also so that ma'am can directly uh, answer okay ravi prashad so ma you may come forward with your question question so ravi prashad so you raised your hand uh, you can put forward your question Uh, 
I think Hello? he's me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, sir. My presentation is tomorrow, sir. No. Okay. Okay. No. 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 We are actually uh, that the organizers will no. say. So, uh, sir, if sir, you have any is... pertinent questions to the presentations made by Professor Shrabani Shah, you can just raise questions if you wish to. Okay, I think uh, she is waiting for something else. Anyone uh, from the from the from the, from the audience, those who are listening uh, to Ma'am's lecture, so if you want to ask any question, please. You can write your question in the chat box also. Okay, probably. Uh, Professor uh, it seems, uh, it Professor seems that there is. Uh, uh, probably there is no questions, and if any questions is there, please write in the chat box. Our moderator will collect the questions and surely send to our honorable speaker, Professor Chakraborty. Okay, uh, so uh, Madam, possibly uh, they were trying to grasp uh, whatever you told the reality you have unfolded, and uh, really, really, I'm privileged uh, to welcome you as well as to uh, get the opportunity to listening to you. Uh, so it's a great, great privilege and possibly in the days to come that you will come here physically and we'll be having more live discussions in that way. I express uh, on behalf of the organizing committee uh, as well, I express my sincere gratitude. I understand you have a very present situation. Uh, you are moving from uh, one international forum to other to negotiate different issues on developmental issues. In spite of that, you spare time. We express our sincere gratitude to you, ma'am. And I hope that you remain stay safe, stay well, and uh, stay connected. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Anjan and everyone, uh, for inviting me. And I know that it is uh, these are the very important issues. And sometimes maybe we watch the news and see what is happening. But if we go more deeper and deeper, then we can see how the situation actually. So these are the important place now, like web seminar, because physical presentation is difficult because of this COVID. So this kind of arrangement is really helpful. And I'm very happy and thankful to you all for inviting me in this platform. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay, Thank you, Professor Shraboni Shaha. To be with us with her excellent presentation. We are just waiting for her presentation and we are delighted uh, with her presentation. Thank you, ma'am. And it is our hope and expectation in the future you will be with us when we will have some invitation. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, thank you. Professor Anjan Chakraborty, Honorable HRDC Director. Sir, uh, one uh, request is there. We have uh, the session. Uh, uh, yeah, Professor Muhammad Habibur Rahman. Uh, he is waiting in the lobby. I can, I can, I have seen him. Uh, yes, yes, sir. But uh, before that, uh, we have a request. Uh, there are only three presentations that was left because we have to adjust ourselves with the time schedule. Uh, so this is uh, the request from the organizing committee. Uh, to Professor Chakraborty, if you please chair the uh, part of the session, uh, then that will be better. And before that, Amra, Amader Modhe, Amra Ottanta Anundito, Amader Modhe Upasita Chen, Professor Salma Akhtar, Department of Sociology, Dhaka University, Bangladesh. Amra Madam Ke, Amader Binito Onurod, তার কাছ থেকে এই প্রোগ্রামের শুভেচ্ছা বার্তা আমরা আশা করছি খুব অল্প কথার মধ্যে আমি ম্যাডামকে বিনীত অনুরোধ করছি দুই এক কথা বলার জন্য যেটা আমরা সকালে মিস করেছি সো ম্যাম প্লিজ আমাদের ক্ষমা করবেন কারণ দ্যাট ওয়াজ নট আওয়ার ফল্ট দ্যাট ইজ দ্য ফল্ট অফ দ্য ওয়েব আওয়ার ইন্টারনেট সো প্লিজ ডিলাইটেড আস উইথ সাম ফিউ ওয়ার্স আমি আশা করছি ঘনিষ্ঠ বন্ধু 
এবং এক কথায় উনি রাজি হয়েছেন উনি কিছুদিন আগেই কোভিড থেকে উঠেছেন তার সত্ত্বেও আমাদের কথা ফেরাননি এবং আমাদের দেশের পক্ষ থেকেও আমি অত্যন্ত সাদর অভ্যর্থনা জানাচ্ছি এবং কৃতজ্ঞতা জানাচ্ছি ধন্যবাদ অঞ্জন এবং এই ওয়েবিনারের আয়োজক কর্তৃপক্ষ সবাইকে আমি সকালে যেটা বলছিলাম যে আমার কাছে যেটা সবচেয়ে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ মনে হয়েছে সেটা হচ্ছে যে এই ওয়েবিনারের যে টাইটেলটা সেটা একেবারেই সময় উপযোগী সাস্টেনেবল ডেভেলপমেন্ট গোল এই মুহূর্তে আমার মনে হয় যে পৃথিবীর প্রতিটি দেশের জন্য সবচেয়ে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ একটি বিষয় এবং এটা যে একটা ইন্টি ডিসিপ্লিনারি এবং মাল্টি ডিসিপ্লিনারি অ্যাপ্রোচ থেকে দেখা দরকার সায়েন্স আর্টস সোশ্যাল সায়েন্স অ্যান্ড বিজনেস পার্সপেকটিভ থেকে দেখা উচিত সেটা এই ওয়েবিনারটা খুব সঙ্গত ভাবে উপস্থাপন করেছে আমার কাছে যেটা সবচেয়ে বেশি ভালো লেগেছে যে আমি যেটা দেখতে পেয়েছি প্রায় আশি থেকে নব্বই জন পেপার প্রেজেন্টার এখানে ছিলেন এবং তারা ভারতের বিভিন্ন বিশ্ববিদ্যালয় থেকে কলেজ থেকে এসেছেন এবং আন্তর্জাতিক স্পিকারও এখানে ছিলেন সবচেয়ে যেটা ভালো লাগলো যে অনেক ডিসিপ্লিনে পার্টিসিপেন্টস আমরা এখানে ছিলাম সো আমাদের জন্য যেটা সবচেয়ে আমার কাছে আমার নিজের কাছে সবচেয়ে বেশি প্রয়োজনীয় মনে হয়েছে এবং আমি নিজে অনেক কিছু শেখার চেষ্টা করেছি আমি খুব দুঃখিত আজকে আমার আরও কিছু প্রায়র মিটিংস ছিল অ্যাপয়েন্টমেন্টস ছিল সবগুলো প্রেজেন্টেশন আমি শুনতে পাইনি কিন্তু যেগুলো আমি শুনতে পেয়েছি আমার কাছে যেটা মনে হয়েছে যে এই বিষয়গুলো যে খুব ইন্টার এবং সাস্টেনেবল ডেভেলপমেন্ট গোলস এর ক্ষেত্রে যে জেন্ডার ইন্টারসেকশনালিটি এবং অন্য সব ফ্যাক্টার্স গুলো সোশ্যাল ইকোনমিক অ্যান্ড পলিটিক্যাল ফ্যাক্টার্স গুলো যে রয়েছে একদিকে পলিটিক্যাল উইল অন্যদিকে সোশ্যাল ইনস্টিটিউশন অ্যান্ড অ্যাটিটিউড আরেক দিকে যে আমাদের ইকোনমিক ক্যাপাবিলিটি সেই ইস্যুগুলো এখানে চমৎকার ভাবে উঠে এসেছে আমার আমি খুবই অ্যাপ্রিসিয়েট করি আয়োজকদেরকে এবং আমি সফলতা কামনা করছি এটি একটি সফল ওয়েবিনার কারণ তো আমার মনে হচ্ছে যে আমার আমার নিজের কাছে দারুণ ভালো লেগেছে এবং আমি যেটা দেখেছি যে প্রচুর পার্টিসিপেন্ট সারা দিন ধরে ডিসকাশনগুলো শুনেছেন সেটা একটা ভীষণ রকম আনন্দের বিষয় আমার কাছে মনে হয় যে ভবিষ্যতে আমি মনে করি এই ধরনের একটি ওয়েবিনার আরো বেশি দরকার এবং সেখানে যেটি সংযুক্ত করা যেতে পারে যে আমরা পরস্পরের আন্তদেশীয় আন্ত রিজিয়ন থেকে কিভাবে আসলে সাকসেস অ্যান্ড চ্যালেঞ্জগুলো শিখতে পারি আমার কাছে মনে হয় যে ভারতের অনেকগুলো স্টেট চমৎকার করছে কোনো কোনো পার্টিকুলার এসটিজিতে বাংলাদেশ কোথাও কোথাও ভালো করছে তেমনি অন্য অন্য অনেকগুলো দেশ আছে যারা পার্টিকুলার এসডিজিতে ভালো করছে তো আমরা যারা একটু এক একটা বিষয়ে পিছিয়ে আছে যেমন আমি বলছিলাম বাংলাদেশ কিন্তু জেন্ডার ভায়োলেন্সের ক্ষেত্রে চাইল্ড ম্যারেজের ক্ষেত্রে পিছিয়ে আছে যেখানে জেন্ডারের অন্য ইন্ডিকেটরগুলোতে বাংলাদেশ চমৎকার করছে তেমনি ভারতের কাছ থেকে এবং অন্য আমাদের যে সাউথ এশিয়ান রিজিয়ন আমার মনে হচ্ছে রিজিয়নাল বন্ডেজ আরও বেশি দরকার রিজিয়নাল একাডেমিক রিসার্চ নেটওয়ার্ক এবং সেটার উপর ইমপ্লিমেন্টেশন লেভেলে কাজ করা লার্নিং ফ্রম ইচ আদার অনেক বেশি জরুরি কথা বলতে চাই না অনেক অনেক শুভেচ্ছা সব পার্টিসিপেন্টসদের জন্য এবং আমি আমার আন্তরিক কৃতজ্ঞতা প্রকাশ করছি আমাকে এই পার্টিসিপেশন করতে দেওয়ার জন্য এবং বিশেষ করে এই এই একটা আমি মনে করি যে বেশ একটি বড় ধরনের আয়োজনের একটি অংশ হওয়ার জন্য ধন্যবাদ थैंक यू थैंक यू সালমা थैंक यू রহমান স্যার কে বলুন আমাদের ধন্যবাদ বাংলাদেশের বিশিষ্ট সোশ্যাল রিফর্মার রিসার্চ রিসার্চার যার কন্ট্রিবিউশন সোসাইটিতে অনেক বড় তার অবদান সোসাইটির জন্য অনেক বেশি ইফেক্টফুল এরকম একজন পার্সোনালিটি ইন্টারন্যাশনাল পার্সোনালিটিকে আমরা আমাদের ওয়েব সেমিনারে পেয়েছি বলে এপিসি রায় গভর্নমেন্ট কলেজ অ্যাজ ওয়েল অ্যাজ এইচআরডিসি এন ভিউ নিজেদেরকে অনেক বেশি ধন্য মনে করছে থ্যাংক ইউ সালমা ম্যাডাম ফর ইয়োর বেস্ট উইশেস থ্যাংক ইউ ম্যাম ঢাকা I already requested our chair, Professor Anjan Chakraborty, to complete the session. I request, humble request from the organizing section to Professor Habibur Rahman. Sir, if please you allow us, then it will be better for us to conclude the technical session. Then we will come to the international speech. Sir, please. 
So may I kindly request uh, uh, Professor Habu, Habibu Rahman to stay Habibu tuned, Habibu. Uh, stay linked. Just three presenters are there, so possibly they are waiting for a lot with a lot of exci with ex excitement. And it would be very good for them that since a uh, 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 kind of academician like you uh, will uh, give a hearing to their presentation, so that they will be enriched. Uh, so, ma'am, with your due permissions, uh, may I allow these three participants to present? So they will make a brief presentation. Yes, please, Prof. Please proceed. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I request Professor Navunita Pal, moderator of this technical session, to take over the session. Two words proceed. Professor Navunita Pal, please. Thank you. Now we will resume our previous session. And at that time, we are a little bit disappointed because of our session comes to an end abruptly. But now we consider ourselves blessed that we have eminent person with us for this chair and this session. Okay. So uh, I'm asking Muhammad Samimul Azim, are you here to present? Then Nishka Tama. Yes, Nishka? yes, yes, ma'am, I'm here. To shall I? Start your, start your presentation and remember you will get all the five minutes. Hello? Hello? Nishka, you start. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm presenting. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm presenting. Hello, madam. I'm Bapal Kuzmochi. Hello. So, Mr. Bapal, so, you can just wait. Uh, uh, let uh, madam, Mr. Uh, madam, Mr. Madam, Mr. Madam, Mr. Madam, Mr. Hello. Uh, is my slide visible? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. It's visible. Visible okay. and audible. Still done. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll begin. Okay, so I'm Nisha Tamun from the Department of Geography, Dazzling Government College. Uh, today's electronic gadget is tomorrow's e-west. So my topic for the evening will dwell upon e-west in India. So as we all know, solid waste management, which is already a huge burden in India, is becoming more problematic by the influx of e-west and especially its computer waste. And moreover, with this COVID pandemic on and lockdown imposed, the use of smartphone and computers have grown many fold, taking the West burden to a new height. Now, EU defines this new, or I should say, fastest growing waste stream as West Electrical and Electronic Equipment, WEEE. -E. But I think in a layman's term, it is worn out electrical equipment and can be termed as development related, you know, like West, because everything, uh, all the, you know, like um, equipments, they are development related. So Central Pollution Control Board, for the first time, they quantified the e-waste generated in India in the past three financial years. And the most important problem, what I see here in this slide is the percentage increase. Uh, to 31.6 percent from 2019 um, say 18 19 to 2019 20 so this is uh this percentage is, is really a matter of concern so when we talk about uh, you know like e-waste what comes to our mind is whether it is toxic or not or whether it is hazardous so generally speaking you know like if e-waste is handled in a proper scientific manner and if it is stocked in safe storage or recycled properly, so it will not pose any problem. It is hazardous, of course, if if it is not uh, if it is not handled uh, in a scientific manner as well as in a primitive method. So, and moreover, there are you know certain toxic elements which are found in certain electronic uh, products, which uh, which uh, you know like uh, it uh, hampers the environment and also. Uh, it depends upon the toxic uh, toxicity again depends upon their condition as well as their density and the toxic substances include lead cadmium uh, you know pcb which are found in pcb boards uh, cathode crt uh, tubes uh, cadmium is found in monitor while there are many mercury you know which is found in flat screen monitors cfls relays and other equipments or uh, other electronic gadgets 
So these are some of the sources of e-waste. So basically what we see is almost all the, uh, you know, the major sources are derived from, you know, the, the cell phones, the mobile phones, uh, the television, the computers and computer uh, appliances. Now, when we look into the policies, so uh, uh, e-waste rules was, uh, you know, it was revised in 2016. So previously there was e-waste uh, management rules, to th management and handling rules 2011. This was revised in the year 2016. So the most important uh, parameter or the most important new aspect of this, the revised rule that is to uh, 2016 is, you know, the producers have made more accountable for e-waste collection and for e-waste exchange because because it coins a term which is called epr that is extended producer responsibility okay so it mandates only the authorized dismantlers and recyclers to collect e-waste and presently in our country in india we have 400 dismantlers or recyclers which are you know at uh, uh, war footage they are operating in 20 states so fortunately even in west bengal we have one now when we look into the different uh, facts or the fact sheet of e-waste in india we know that india is the third largest e-waste generator in the world after china and the usa so what uh, i just want to point one important thing uh, regarding this first statement is like both india and china they are the asian countries so it is uh, UNDP rightly said that uh, you know like um, asian countries are the engines of waste generators so this helps true in my first statement so and india recycles very less amount of uh, e-waste uh, it's uh, less than two percent of e-waste is you know like uh, it is processed or it is recycled in a formal manner and almost 95% of this is recycled in an informal sector and uh, which is uh, which is in a very very crude manner so it poses a serious problem to the health of the citizen as well as the environment so again when it comes to the recipient of e west india ranks fifth after china peru ghana niger and nigeria and amongst the top 10 cities which generates e-waste mumbai is the first uh, I, I mean the last uh, i mean the first uh, you know it ranks first in terms of e-waste uh, generate uh, generators and uh, followed by delhi bengaluru chennai and of course we have kolkata in our, in our state ahmedabad hyderabad pune surat and nagpur and moreover one very important aspect of this uh, you know e-waste boom is also the boom in the smartphone uh, smartphone sector so because india is to have almost 820 million smartphone users by 2022 and regarding the smartphone uses india again ranks third on average smartphone users that means uh, okay oh yes 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 okay so e-waste concerns and challenges and come to conclusion okay so what we so these are the effects of on the environment uh, and uh, and this so what i just want to emphasize is you know like we should not put trash everywhere because one month's trash is again another man's treasure so you just do, uh, donate it to increase the lifespan and let's live a sustainable life and make society more sustainable because you know the earth is what we all have in common and there's no planet called planet b and let's not conclude let's begin a uh, fight towards waste management especially e-waste management so besides reduce reuse recycle recover i want you all to add repair also because repairing again is very very important for sustainable uh, you know development thank you so much thank you very much anisha madam uh, for uh, i understand that you have under serious time constraints yes. uh, <laughs> but this issue is really pertinent and a burning issue uh, just uh, two but uh, things I would like to add here that uh, mm -hmm. we do not have any care about so far the EU waste is concerned. Now this corporate social responsibility we talk about, but uh, mm -hmm. the, from where we purchasing this uh, e items, uh, yes. they should. There is a new waste. So there is a movement is going on that okay I can just use it and when I have to uh, 
I have to dump it. Okay, I'll go to that particular shop and give it to the, give it back to them. And they'll, okay, this is the US, so you you need to take care. And there is a, a kind of a system in place, but that kind of awareness and social corporate social responsibility is missing. And uh, people like us, we are also mm -hmm. least concerned about that. Uh, so therefore, you have very rightly pointed out uh, that how we can uh, have a sustainable uh, livelihood pattern and uh, some emerging issues, which is very pertinent. Uh, it's a nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha, madam. So okay. next presenter, please. Well, Bappa Dittu, go. You may start now. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 Upostit. Sokol Kema. Andris. Hello. 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 Audio on the Okay. Bangladeshite আর জানি বলে একাধিক ভাবনা শৈল আমাদের মাথার উপর ভিড় করে প্রশ্ন জাগে না না আর সেই জন্য তার গভীর লোকটা লোক সাধারণ ভাষা লোক সাধারণ বলতে ও সম্ভব বুঝি অশিক্ষিত অর্ধশিক্ষিত মুখে ব্যবহৃত এজন্য বিশেষ সমাজে বিশেষ কোন গোষ্ঠী যার মধ্যে কার পাত যে আমরা সামাজিক রাষ্ট্রিক পরিমণ্ডলে কিছু অনুসঙ্গ দিতে পারি লোকগত স্বরূপ বৈশিষ্ট্য সম্পর্কে আমরা সকলে প্রায় কম বেশি জানি আমাদের বাংলা সাহিত্যে রবীন্দ্রনাথ ঠাকুর কি বলেছিল আমরা দেখেনি বাংলা অসাধু ভাষা খুব জোয়ার ভাষা এবং তার চেহারা বলি একটা পদার্থ আছে সে আউলের মুখে ভক্ত কবি গানে ছড়া আমরা আসলে লোকভাষা আর উপভাষা সম্পূর্ণ আলাদা তবে হ্যাঁ দুটো কিন্তু আঞ্চলিক ভাষা ভাষা প্রথম স্তরে আছে লোকভাষা বা গ্রাম প্রান্তীয় বর্গীয় অশিক্ষিত সেখানে মানুষের জীবন চর্চা সংলগ্ন মেটো ভাষা বিভিন্ন শ্রেণী ক্ষেত্র আছে হাফা মানুষের যেমন মস্তজীবী তন্তুবা রাজমিস্ত্রী দাসা ভুসো কয়লা প্রভৃতি যারা মধ্যে এসব পেশা সঙ্গে যুক্ত তাদের প্রাকৃত যে কথ্য ভাষা যার মধ্যে দিয়ে তার একটা সাধারণ এলাকার মধ্যে ভাগ বিভিন্ন করে এটা লোকভাষা যেমন আমরা বলতে পারি তাসা তাসা হুসুদের ভাষা কাদা তা দেওয়া চাপান বোকা এগুলো বলতে পারছি ভাষা আমরা বুঝতে পারছি লোকভাষা প্রাকৃতিক জনের ভাষা আম জনতা ভাষা লোকভাষা যখন বৃষ্টি দাকার পায় তখন সেটা উপভাষা বিস্তীর্ণ হয় তো উপভাষার পর আমার কাছে তার আদর্শ ভাষা বৈচিত্রে লোকভাষা বৈশিষ্ট্য লোকসাহিত্যের ভাষা অবশ্যই লোকভাষা লোকভাষা ছড়া প্রবাদ ভাধা যদি লোক সাহিত্যের বিভিন্ন উপাদান বা উপকরণ তার শব্দবন্ধ হচ্ছে লোকভাষা তো হ্যাঁ সব লোকভাষা এক নয় প্রবাদ যে কোমল শব্দ প্রবাদের যে এত প্রমূলক প্রাণ অনুসঙ্গ যে শব্দ যে আমাদের সামাজিক সাংস্কৃতিক কালচার তার শব্দ বা ধারা শব্দ অলঙ্কার ব্যবহার আবেগ উৎসাহ পেলবতা একাধিক বৈশিষ্ট্য আজ লোকভাষার সম্পদ 
লগতে উচ্চ বিস্তারে যেমন আমরা বলতে পারি যে ওলো হ্যালো বৌড়ি হ্যাঁ ভাতার আবার এই সমস্ত যে অশ্লীল শব্দ এগুলো এগুলো লোকভাষার বৈশিষ্ট্য সামাজিক রাজনৈতিক রাষ্ট্রিক বিপর্যস্ত যে বিষয় লোকসভা জীবন চর্যা দেওয়া বাস ও বিভঙ্গ এখানে অশান্তি বাতাবরণ লোকভাষার চালচিত্র যুগের হাওয়া বারো বদলে যাচ্ছে স্থায়ীভাবে লোকভাষার দিগন্ত উন্মোচনে অনধিক লম্বে আগন্তুক সাহিত্যিক রসিদের গবেষণা সম্প্রসারিত হলে খুব ক্ষতি হবো উঠে আসবে আরো অনেক শব্দ সুতরাং আমার আমার যেটা বক্তব্য যা আমি আশা করছি আমি আশা করি যে নতুন গবেষকরা আসুক তারা এই এই যে মেঠো ভাষা যেটা হারিয়ে যাচ্ছে শিল্পায়ন নগরায়ন বিশ্বায়ন শব্দগুলোকে একটা একটা অভিধান যেটা পরবর্তীকালে আমাদের দিক পর্যন্ত প্রণাম জানিয়ে Hello? Hello ma'am? Hello, I understand your problem. We are requesting Nisha to uh, stop her sharing. Now, now, we can, uh, now she is removed from the, our web platform. You can share. All right? You start sharing. I hope the platform is now easy for you. All right? So, Mr. Raila, you can uh, make your presentation. Raila, if you are unable to present your screen, can you start simply or give your audio version? I think uh, he is facing some web-related issues. Is Raal the last presenter or uh, no, it fails in there? No, no, no. He is the last presenter, sir. Okay. okay. Raal, uh, I'm sorry. You know, we, we, we simply skip your presentation because we are awaiting for a, another international speech. Raal, extremely sorry. Okay, with this, I would like to... ঢাকা 
He is also the founder president of community social work practice and development. He was also the proctor of that university and syndicate member. Uh, he is also the editor of the journal that's published from that particular university. Uh, he he is into uh, different kind of uh, consultancy work and especially in relation to uh, decent labor rights of informal waste and sanitation workers. Uh, he prepared the guidelines for occupational health and safety of the informal waste and sanitation workers in Bangladesh and many more. Now, I don't want to cut out uh, uh, his lecture by just elongating uh, the CV. Certainly, he is having a very illustrious career as an academician and as well as social worker. And it's a real, real privilege, uh, sir, that you have readily agreed to deliver an invited lecture on behalf of my country, on behalf of UGC Human Resource Development Center, University of North Bengal, as well as FUC Rai Government College. Uh, we heartily welcome you and will, I can, I can, uh, I welcome you of our lecture. You can start your lecture. So uh, you can take, uh, say, 35 to 40 minutes for delivering your lecture, and then we can uh, get into a QA session question answer sessions. You are welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. It's my indeed pleasure and honor, actually. I'm very delighted to be here today. And actually, first of all, I should thank Honorable Professor, my mentor even, Professor Salma. She's here, so far I could see. And actually, she made me connected here today. I'm honored and my heartfelt congratulations to, to the organizer of such a very prestigious and multi-connected, multidisciplinary, uh, thought-provoking international webinar. This is, I should say, inclusivity of sustainable development. And so far I could understand, this is a holistic thought-sharing platform. You cover so most, I mean, so for all the areas of knowledge and thoughts within these two days. And I just followed some uh, interesting presentation uh, that was really marvelous. And one presentation, and also Professor Salma actually highlighted on sustainable development. Actually, my thought is different as so far I'm the closing speaker in that sense before you. That I follow from the last presentation is uh, SDZ closely focusing on no one live behind. I mean the 10 percent, 8 to 10 percent population of its country, those who are still behind. Uh, that is that was reflected on the last presentation, E West or West speakers, and you, you might say. I have been studying on, on this area especially just to dignifying the livelihood pattern of the West speakers. But I shouldn't say like this. My topic is just sharing and caring during this COVID because I do believe this time staying in the last days of this two days, the first part of the conference that is being organized by uh, Sri Acharya Prafulla Chandra Roy Government College, Shiliguri, and in association with UGC Human Resource Development Center, I followed Sir Director. HRDC wonderfully anchoring this session since morning. So I just share my some thoughts as a social worker, as in community organizer. So many presentation you have been achieving and acquiring knowledge in depth, but I will just give you some focuses on, on specifically reestablishing academic mindset of students. When day before yesterday, Mr. Bishwajit Roy contacted me. Instantly, I just give him a feedback. I'm interested to share my thoughts on publishing mindset during this COVID. Because, you know, globally, when COVID attacked, Bangladesh actually got the first cases identified on uh, 20, 28th of March. And after that, all the institutions, school, colleges, universities, got closer uh, end of this, I mean, 1st of April, so far, I, I could recall approximately 18 months, closely two years. We have been confined students, so for the guardians and the teachers at home with the devices, with the personal meeting room, 
with the Google Meet or the Zoom, avoiding sometimes the relationship from the relatives. So far, we are highlighting that we are having time to get the con get, get connected with the relatives, with the children, with the uh, closest ones. Sometimes, some people mentioning this is kind of uh, opportunity to get family rebuild. But I am just sharing another thought in Bangladesh. All the schools, colleges, and uh, especially college level uh, got reopened routine basis. One class, one day in a, in a week per week, maintaining health safety measures. But problem is the disaster. Actually, we have nothing to do. That that was we are bound to maintain. We are bound to stack up of this staying at home. Get, get relation with the devices, laptop, mobile phone, tab, television, and other technological devices. We already trans. I should speak actually, keeping a specific focus on research finding. But I thought that student this time was the actually next generation of the nation. How we can help them to reestablish their mindset? They are coming out of home just to attend one or two classes without finding no other hopes and options as COVID has uh, unlimited directions to stop and just uh, stop this pandemic. When authorities open school colleges, they are coming home. I'm sharing just today's or yesterday feelings from some students here, those I interviewed. And also some viral cases in, on the Facebook and YouTube even. There is two way. One is the guardian and the authorities of school, they still thinking to keep them distant. But when they're coming into college and schools, after one year and six or seven months to go to be closer and just uh, uh, they try to hug someone just to maintain their relationship from their emotion which was really tough to control. Beside the mindset of study, in my home, when I see my daughter, my, my kids, my, my son, they occasionally, they are not interested to talk to us, avoiding their tab, laptop, and mobile phone. They establish their mindset with that, rather physically coming to the classroom, and study and get connected with the teachers, get feedback from the teachers, which is very alarming. Actually, I was thinking how students can be motivated. Then I thought, actually, we are designing a project on that, a triangular model. As a social worker, we thought just to support the relation. Is the relation, is the academy, make them connected? I just thought about a triangular model to reestablishing mindset of the student. One is teacher, parents, I mean guardians, and the student. Currently, I do believe with the guardians and parents, equally the teachers, has a huge increased responsibility after, I mean, the mid of the pandemic. Because students, young generations, adults and children, they are becoming isolated and self-centered they are becoming frustrated and depressed gradually. So our care with a motive, sharing and caring is very, very vital. Distinguished panelists, speakers, guest moderator, organizer, my actually humble request to all of you, please look into the faces, eye contacts, posture, gesture, movement of your children your special attention understanding their appearance mindset eye contact and the notion and movement might save them i thought re-establishing mindset from the devices to the classroom teaching as universities colleges and schools are reopening it might create some additional frustration to them because they are already habituated Initially, they were habituated with some horror to the new normal situation. After a few months, it was amazingly abnormal. Again, this is 
uh, from the abnormal, this is normal, but from the normal, they are coming again to another kind of new normal, which is classroom. I thought that I just uh, recall in my mindset that how my children or my child are being grown up, being, being socialized, being shared and cared with them in family as they are avoided from the months and from the peer groups, from the society, from the cultural organizations out of the family. So they are in a, in a, in a pattern nowadays at home with the devices. They are good. They might have some knowledge, but devices also creating some problems. As you know, in, in the devices, in the internet, uh, in, the, in the Googles, YouTube, they, ha they are having so many alternatives. So how we can control our children, that is also a key, key portion, key, key actually concern for us. So my today's just summary is reestablishing academic mindset of students during COVID, of course, allows and invites specific and special attention from the parents, from the teachers, parents at home, teachers at school, college and universities because students are actually uh, derailed sometime in that sense, they are not being guided properly over this last so for 18 months. So we have so many responsibilities when our children coming at schools, colleges and universities after their devices, when they're just sitting at classroom, teachers, especially teachers have uh, um, enormous things to just uh, give attention to them. So I do believe we are very aware to, in, in a caring mindset to the students, uh, just to sharing and caring basis. So my topic, my motive is sharing is caring is the best, best option to motivate the children, to keep them changing their mindset from devices to uh, actually the classroom teaching that's being as being instituted, uh, be, uh, being reopened. And especially thanks goes to the organizers again to uh, make me privileged, especially to few, uh, share a few half hazard words. Uh, but I do believe this kind of platform is very, very helpful for the young researcher to create a cultural mindset, to create a, uh, knowledge sharing, reciprocity of knowledge and sharing and caring, all these things. Special thanks to Honorable Moderator, Honorable Director, HRDC, UCC, and uh, other distinguished panelists, speakers, and especially Professor Salma, Madam is here. Actually, Madam made me connected. Uh, uh, and I'm very happy, delighted to share these few words together. Hope to see you again, sir. And invitation to visit Bangladesh again after this relaxed COVID. Hope to see you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Avivur Rahman, sir. Uh, it's absolutely the issue you raised. Uh, it's hardly been discussed. Uh, mostly we discuss about the economy, society, livelihood, life, all we have discussed. But what is the mental status uh, and especially the stress and strain that is the across the age group they are facing, we hardly work on that. And uh, you have rightly pointed out that how we can move away from the gadgets, uh, that gadgets which are allowing us to connect, because this, uh, we can understand the uh, on the pitfalls of these gadgets. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, say a child, especially a child and the children and those who are at the adolescent stage, how their mind is getting affected and how long that impact or the, that effect would be there, uh, we are not studying at all. Uh, rather, we are keen to running the business that, okay, education of the digital rightly pointed out and brought the focus to the uh, to the arena why it should be and as usual the guardian teachers and the students so if you if you see visualize any of the institution we are primary level education uh, system or at the highest levels uh, universities uh, so the uh, and if we take the society as a whole so this triangle actually uh, uh, 
it 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 it, it actually uh, engross or uh, the entire society so therefore until unless the at right from the uh, from the from the primary level to the highest level uh, we cannot think about the psychological impact uh, that is that is, uh, we are going through uh, possibly will not do justice and i can uh, still remember uh, i can still visualize because Tegar concept of education system where that kids used to learn and uh, so they studies under the trees we didn't adapt that at any point of time rather we keep on creating uh, concrete edifices and uh, keep on adding gadgets and so on and so forth and gradually we are moving away from the environment possibly one of the reasons of the covid 19 that see uh, that if it is coming from bats or pangolin whatever may be but we have reduces the space space for bats and pangolin and that is why this transmission is taking place so uh, your presentations and i i am really grateful to again uh, salma madam uh, professor salma Akhtar, and uh, who become a kind of my family member in a very short possible time uh, and uh, she is connecting you so in the that our family is getting extended. We are really, really grateful to uh, Salma Madam as well as to you, and we hope that we'll remain connected. Uh, and to, as and when situation will permit, uh, we'll be here uh, together, be it in the Bangladesh or be it India together, and certainly we'll take care of the issues that has been raised, and maybe on some pertinent issues, we'll work collectively so that uh, we can create a better society. I express my sincere gratitude again on behalf of the organizing committee uh, uh, for, for uh, lending uh, such a beautiful thought uh, before us. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Thank you, Anand sir. And we are somewhat delighted from Dr. Hamidun Rahman sir's deliberation. He has pointed out that he has given us some haphazard word. No, sir, actually, it was a highly synchronized and it's a garland of words. We we'll find it in a garland of words. And your uh, deliberation boosts us in changing the mindset of set minds of our students. We are hoping that we are soon meet our real class too. So we will keep your word in mind. Thank you, sir. And I now request our organizing secretary, Akash sir, to continue the session. Akash sir, over to you. Thank you, Professor Nobunita Pal, moderator of this technical session. On behalf of organizing committee, seminar organizing committee, APC Roy Government College, Chiliguri, West Bengal, India. Muhammad Habib Rahman, one of the eminent social reformer of Bangladesh, for his exclusive talk on this major issue related with the use of the computer and computer gadgets or related part and what is the effect, cause and effect on the child and the children, mental setup and etc. So many important discussions are there. Now, this is the section to conclude the overall part. Professor Anjan Chakraborty. So many thanks to Professor uh, Director Chakraborty because he not only maintaining the chair session, but also maintaining the equal halves or the more halves of the program as a collaborating agency or a collaborating section. Actually, this should be the actual form of collaboration. All types of helps and cooperation uh, are coming from UGC, HRDC, and director said, uh, from organizing committee, we again express our heartful gratitude to Professor Chakraborty to become with us, to a part of us, and will be a part of tomorrow also. Thank you, Professor Chakraborty. Okay, I extend my sincere gratitude to um, all of you. Uh, and uh, UGC Human Resource Development Center, as at the inaugural session, we told that, uh, okay, uh, so long we'll get uh, more and more connected and we'll work collectively, uh, possibly we'll do justice to our society. Uh, and with that mission, so I got a kind of a beautiful friend, uh, like uh, uh, Professor Salma um, uh, is there. Uh, I got uh, Muhammad Habibur, we got Samunidi and tomorrow more are there. So in that way, even in a, in a closed-door situations, we are getting more emotionally connected, which is more, most important 
and possibly if we remain emotionally connected, uh, many of the issues get sorted out, will be sorted out. So that is our pious goal and I'm really thankful to our international delegates. Thank you. Thank you very much. An international interdisciplinary webinar. This is a two days program. Today, the whole day, we categorize or classify the total program into two major sessions. One of the inaugural session, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Honorable Dean for Science, North Bengal University, uh, Dr. Shantanu Chakraborty, ex officer in charge of Episcopal Government College, and so many dignitaries were there. Uh, and uh, that, that was a successful inaugurating program. We have a huge amount of delighted uh, lecture was there, inspiration was there in the uh, inauguration session. Then the technical session was there, invited lecture was there. Invited lecture uh, was first invited lecture we enjoyed from Professor Salma Akhtar, Department of Sociology, Dhaka University, Bangladesh. Then technical session one was there and it was divided into three major uh, section, technical session A, B, C, and in that part, so many papers from economy as it is interdisciplinary to maintain the dignity, quality of, of that part. Uh, we already uh, communicated or amalgamated the section economic, sociology, uh, and political science, geography, Bengali, English, literature, history in a same platform as it was an interdisciplinary section. So there is a uh, combination of different sub uh, subjects, uh, paper presentation was there, and about uh, 65 presenter was there with their beautiful presentation, with their fundamental research work they presented uh, uh, before the chairperson. And we had with us the chair, Dr. Bhaskar Goswami, Honorable Head of the Department, Economics, Bardhaman University, Dr. Swati Bhattacharya, Department of Philosophy, Krishnanagar Government College, Dr. Kaushik Dhan, Department of Economics, FCI Government College, Dr. Dalia Bhattacharya, Department of History, University of North Bengal, Darjeeling, West Bengal, Dr. Shapan Kumar Chorkar, Department of Political Science, P.R. Thakur Government College, Dr. Sudash Lama, <coughs> Department of History, University of North Bengal. We had another important invited speech from eminent speaker, Professor Shravani Shaha and Professor Habib Rahman. And now the session should be concluded. So I think uh, Professor Habib Rahman uh, should uh, would, uh, say something. So please, sir. Thank you for giving me chance again for a minute. Uh, Acta Bisho share Kora Junior Shulam Henry School Silam. Oh, she said. Invitation the Arjuna Made. Madam Asanji to Madame Rupustiti, Bolab Halo, Madam Made Amidia Foundation Lead Kuri, Community Social Work Practice and Development Foundation. Uta Thike Gotu Charbosur Thike Bangladesh regular consecutive year every year since two thousand seventeen. আমরা two days international conference করি এবং একই ধারাবাহিকতে এবছর আমাদের যে conference ছিল সেটা four days ছিল international conference April three থেকে six এই চার দিনের total একশো সাতচল্লিশটা paper presented হয়েছে এবং more than approximately sixty countries participant ছিল সেখানে directly indirectly involved ছিল এবং যে কারণে আসলে আমি floatটা নিতে চেয়েছিলাম আমরা আমাদের foundation থেকে এবছর শুরু করেছি একটা ইন্টারন্যাশনাল নিউজলেটার বের করছে যেটার নাম হচ্ছে কমিউনিটি টকস এটা হার্ড কপি এবং ই ভার্সন দুটোই আছে দেখা যায় কিনা यस স্যার ইট ইজ ভিজিবল এটা হচ্ছে আমাদের একটা নিউজলেটার এবং এই প্রথম যে ইস্যুটা আমরা টাইটেল করেছিলাম কোভিড এর কারণে স্ট্রেংদেনিং কমিউনিটি রেসিলিয়েন্স এন্ড গ্লোবাল কানেক্টেডনেস এখানে আমি আমরা আমরা যে লেখাগুলো পেয়েছি তাতে টোটাল 19টা দেশের उन्नत्रिश जन विदेशी लेखा आज मध्य अर्थात आउट अफ बांगलेश मैडम आज एडिटोरियल बोर्ड एडभइजरि बोर्ड एखे जो पे भलो लगे रेसपन्स टूकू हमें इनभाइट कर कारण जरा यांग स्कलार आज 
তারা যেন পরবর্তী সংখ্যায় তারা লেখা দিতে পারে পারসেপশনাল রাইটিং স্টোরি টাইপ রাইটিং টু অর থ্রি পেজেস কামিং যে ইস্যুটা আসছে অর্থাৎ নেক্সট মান্থ মিড অফ মিড অক্টোবরে আমরা যেটা লঞ্চ করছি সেকেন্ড ইস্যু এটা স্পেশালি জেরিয়াট্রিক ক্রাইসিস অ্যান্ড কেয়ার গিভিং ডিউরিং কভিড গ্লোবাল পার্সপেকটিভ এই শিরোনামে হবে ম্যাডামের সাথে ফিজিক্যালি দেখা হচ্ছে না এখানে একটু সুযোগ নিলাম ম্যাডাম তো ওই ইস্যুতে যারা লেখা দিতে চাচ্ছেন এখনো সময় আছে আমি ইনবক্সে আমার ইমেল আইডি লিখেছি কেউ যদি লেখা দিতে চায় উইদ ইন টু থাউজেন্ড ফাইভ হান্ড্রেড ওয়ার্ডস স্পেশালি কনসেনট্রেটিং অন এলডারলি ইস্যু কারণ এটা আমাদের এলডারলি হবে এবং অ্যাপ্রক্সিমেটলি সিক্সটিন রাইটিং ফ্রম ডিফারেন্ট সিক্সটিন কান্ট্রিজ আমরা অলরেডি টিল টুডে উই রিসিভ রাইটিং ম্যাডামের একটা লেখা নিশ্চয়ই আমরা চাচ্ছি ওয়েট করছি ম্যাডাম অনেক ব্যস্ত মানুষ তো আশা করি যে রঞ্জন দা আছেন এখানে এবং অন্যান্য যারা আছেন যারা আজকে অনুষ্ঠানে আছেন ইনভাইটেশন আগামী বছর কনফারেন্সের জন্য যদি ফিজিক্যালি সম্ভব হয় ম্যাডামের মাধ্যমে রঞ্জন দাকে ধরেই আমরা সবাইকে কানেক্ট করার চেষ্টা করব এবং আয়োজক যারা আছেন এখানে অবশ্যই আপনারা বাংলাদেশে ভিজিটে আসবেন বাংলাদেশ ঘুরে যাবেন এটা একটা দাওয়াত অগ্রিম দাওয়াত রইল সবার কাছে ইনশাল্লাহ দেখা হবে আর যদি কোনো কারণে কোভিড প্যান্ডেমিক এই অবস্থাতে থেকে যায় অর্থাৎ ট্রাভেল রেস্ট্রিক্টেড থাকে ইউ মাস্ট অ্যাটেন্ড ভার্চুয়ালি ইট উড বি বিগার ওয়ান আমাদের এবছর যা ছিল এর চেয়ে পরবর্তীর আয়োজন আর একটু বড় হবে ডেফিনেটলি আমরা ওভাবে প্রস্তুতি নিচ্ছি তো সবাইকে অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ এবং সুযোগ দেওয়ার জন্য ধন্যবাদ আপনাদেরকে স্পেশালি ম্যাডামকে ম্যাডাম আসলে নির্দেশ দিলে কিছু মানে না করে আসলে থাকতে পারি না এই হলো সমস্যা ম্যাডাম আপনাকে ধন্যবাদ সেই সাথে সবাইকে আমি আমার কৃতজ্ঞতা জানাই আর দ্বিতীয়ত সালমা ম্যাডাম যখন আছেন আপনার সবাই আছেন এবং অলরেডি আমরা যুক্ত হয়ে গেছি ফলে এরপর থেকে যা ইনিশিয়েটিভ হবে ইটস আ ফ্যামিলি ইনিশিয়েটিভ তো উইল রিমেইন ইন টাচ আমি আজকে হয়তো সালমা ম্যাডামের লেখে শুনতে পারি কারণ আমার ওই দিকে কোর্স রান করতে হচ্ছিল জানে थैंक्स <laughs> ধন্যবাদ ধন্যবাদ প্রফেসর হাবিবুর রহমান এমন সুন্দর দাওয়াত অর্থাৎ নিমন্ত্রণ দেওয়ার জন্য আমরা সাদরে সেই নিমন্ত্রণ গ্রহণ করলাম এবং যদি কোভিড এক্সপেক্টেড কোভিড ব্লক হয়ে যাবে এবং আমাদের ট্রাভেল অ্যালাউ হবে এবং শিওর শট আমরা ফিজিক্যালি আপনার প্রোগ্রামে আমরা যাওয়ার চেষ্টা করব থ্যাংক ইউ স্যার ফর দ্যাট সাচ গ্রেট ইনভাইটেশন থ্যাংক ইউ now announcement for the tomorrow tomorrow is the another session uh, there is a special invited uh, sp- uh, lecture from professor modhumita manna additional direct director of public instruction administration education directorate government of west bengal dr indrajit pal disaster preparedness mitigation and management asian institute of technology thailand and another important talk from Dr. Kaushik Das, Department of Physics, University of Maryland, United States of America. So participants and delegates all are humbly requested to be with us in the tomorrow session. And regarding the feedback form and the certificates, we will finally disclose the feedback form along with the uh, certificate, uh, how we can get it and when that will be disbursed. that uh, uh, that declaration will be the tomorrow only and all are uh, again thank you from the part of the organizing committee i as a, a joint uh, org- organizing secretary and vishwajit roy another joint secretary again thank all of you to attend the program hope for the best and see you tomorrow thank you shubharatri okay good Uh, thank you stay well stay safe and stay connected
so thank you sir thank you sir okay bye bye Thank so, you, sir. Sarma. We'll meet again Thank you. either in virtual mood or in a physical uh, kind of a situation. So yes, yeah, hopefully, very soon. And again for HRDC, so I'll keep on calling yeah. you. <laughs> and I'll be a pleasure to have uh, uh, Professor Habibu also. Madam, part of Madam, I'm looking to physically give a doubt to Rashid Chai. Obviously. <laughs> मैडम दादी ली कनेक्शन तो रामी घुरे हैं शी यही दादी के दांत के पास हम उसे चिंता करेंगे चलो शिक्षित ही हमें चिंता करो कारण है है नहीं शे वो कोविड कोविड किच्छ ना हो बे ना हमारे हम लोग गाय लिखे ने वो सेकेंड सेकेंड राउंड सर्वाइव बार थर्ड राउंड सर्वाइव बार राइट ना हमारे मन अच्छे जो वो जो एक्टिव क ट्रैवल रेस्ट्रिक्शन एक तो खाने कर बे और ना कोल लो आम्रा सामान एक तो सर्टिफिकेट नहीं नहीं बो कोनो काबे हाँ हाँ वो भी हैव टू मीट ना थैंक यू ओके खूब भालो थैंक यू सलमा खूब भालो थैंक यू अभी बुझे खूब भालो थैंक यू और आज तो मैं आमने निमंत्रण एवं आमंत्रण दुपे ही थक लो व्य Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So Thank much. you. Stay well. Bye. 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 Bye.